welcome to Estonia, welcome to Tallinn. So I have a pleasure to chair the, the conference of the SCAR for today, at least the morning session. I understand that the chairing of the conference means that I have the only one who, do, who don't have the chair, so I have to stand here. But um, just uh, some technical remarks. Um, at first, uh, there is a live stream, but you don't have to use it, so you can see everything um, online, or not online, but in real life. So, but they, we, we have also Wi-Fi, so the Wi-Fi password was outside um, the room, so probably those of you who need it um, checked it also. Uh, so um, after most of the presentations, maybe not after the opening, we will have also the possibility to put the questions, or you will have the possibility to put the questions. But for the questions, I, I really ask you to use uh, microphones. We have two ladies somewhere with a mic, so you can, if you do not, so then also to stand up and then this is easy. Thank you to put the question so we can uh, catch everything on the tape easily. So, but uh, don't be afraid then to, to, to put the questions. But um, for the opening, for the official opening, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Ilagunetsky, our State Secretary from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Please, the floor is yours. Honored participants, dear guests, good morning and uh, welcome to Estonia. I'm uh, glad to be here today at the conference of the Standing Committee of uh, Agricultural Research and to welcome you all on behalf of the Ministry of uh, Rural Affairs of Estonia, the co organizer of this event. The conference research and innovation policy, state of play and the role of power in the European bioeconomy is the kickoff for an entire week of star events in Tallinn. Today's conference is happening thanks to the cooperation of several different stakeholders. In addition to the presidency, the team of the Spaza Project, presenters from SPARS, various SPAR working groups, and also the OECD, the European Commission, and Tallinn University of Technology have all contributed to the success of this conference. The conference will be followed by the SPAR plenary session in Tallinn. Which is the uh, first time it is held outside of uh, Brussels. We are proud that uh, this honor was given to Estonia. It is a good example of how Estonia and Europe are ready for new initiatives and challenges. For a small nation with a smart use of resources is a central question in every sense. Cross-border and international cooperation is of key importance. The significance of SCAR as a strategic advisory council is huge for a small country like Estonia. That's why we welcome the opportunity to host the SCAR conference and plenary session on a topic very important for us namely by economy. Knowledge based and innovative operations are the foundation of the rural and agricultural sector. We need to put more emphasis on education, knowledge transfer, and enhancing capabilities by creating measures that would allow implementing European research results in all the member states. We need an open and active discussion on how our society as a whole can gain from uh, the more effective use of research-based technologies in the agriculture and food sector. The CSP communication paper stresses that in the future the budget has to be tied more closely to the results and that it has 
to encourage innovation and integrated approaches. It is necessary to decrease the administrative burden imposed for public institutions and producers, processors, and rural areas in general. The same approach must be applied all throughout the various policy papers. The development of the digital and smart agriculture is extremely important if we want to make agricultural production more effective. Guarantee safe and high quality food for the consumer. Ensure animal welfare and more. Important tools for this include, for example, the, the European Innovation Partnership, Knowledge Transfer and Advisory Service. Agriculture has a very important part to play in achieving the sustainable development goals, as it is related to the programs concerning food, climate change, air, water, soil, biodiversity, jobs, and rural development. For Estonia, local breeding and the preservation of genetic resources are important objectives in securing biodiversity. In order to further the common agricultural research area, we need the cooperation of all the regions of Europe. One possible initiative that we are currently having uh, talks on is the Pioneer Initiative. The implementation of this initiative with other European countries would help to enhance our scientific capability. We need innovative solutions that would allow us to transit towards the bioeconomy and take the development of science and agricultural technology of the European Union among the leaders in this field. A strong and sustainable bioeconomy would improve the European economy and reduce its dependence on imports. We will need better knowledge and more technological solutions to develop our bioeconomy and at the same time take into account the special characteristics of our region and how to deal with the challenges facing our society. Ladies and gentlemen, I uh, wish you live and productive discussion and a pleasant stay in Estonia. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. And now we have an introduction and presentation by the, my colleague, and the uh, main topic will be new room in the start. So please, go with yours. Thank you. Um, thank you to the organizers who invited me here today to give an introductory presentation. I'm not going to say a lot because at the end of two days you'll be so fed up to go and do the dance now. Uh, you'd be running away from Karen or running into the old town for a, a beer or something like that. So I'm going to ask you to talk about the new star. What I've got there is it's a new new star, and it's not actually a new star, it's an evolving star. So I'll give a little explanation um, during the presentation. This is the beginning star, 1974, long time ago now. And this is some of the text from the, uh, the legislation behind Star. Star is a uh, statutory uh, body in the EU. And you can see some of the main points here about developing cooperation, helping to advise and uh, the Commission, also the Member States, in the field of the coordination of research and agriculture. So even some of the main points about Star, we're talking about cooperation, we're talking about coordination, 
uh, and I'll talk about research in agriculture. And that was in 1944. Things have changed since then, and I'll come on to that in a minute. So I mentioned from before a long time ago. Don't ask me what was happening in Star 1944. The only thing for that was my primary school on the left there, in the middle of London. So I was playing football, playing pong because I wasn't interested in agricultural research. On the right, you've got some typical school boys from the uh, 1970s. When I was looking for photos at work online, I was thinking it could look a bit dodgy, picking these images of school boys into the search engine. But I, I got away with it. <laughs> and when I was at primary school, there was colour photography as well, so it came to come from the, the black and white time. Anyway, in those days, the, the star was about cooperation, but it was about mainly production, and production linked to a common agricultural policy. So from 74 right through to the 80s and 90s, star played a role. But also, I think it played a role as a kind of program commission in the framework program. Um, but they were from a few different parts, so I'm not so, not so sure about that. So in 2005, we did have a new star. Um, late in the 1990s or the early 2000s, the responsibility for agricultural research moved from the geography across the BC research. But star, the cost of star stayed with the open. There seems to be a time where it went into dormancy. Its role wasn't uh, quite clear. And a small group of member states was set up by our Dutch colleagues, who were grateful to us, thanks to the Netherlands. They set up a group called Free Farm, which tried to duplicate the role of star, um, tried to bring coordination of agricultural research back to the fore in Europe. Um, and that led to the star being transferred from the geography across the BT research where the responsibility for the research lay. Um, a new star was born in 2005, not just around production in agriculture, but around multicultural agriculture. So we're looking at sustainable agriculture, we look at impacts on the environment, we look at social impact, landscape. Um, the whole um, landscape of, of sustainable development. Um, along with the new star, there is now a new steering group set up, the Star Working Group. There was a competition held, a bottle of Austrian wine was uh, an interest, provided a, a bottle of wine and a best name for the Star Working Group. And the winner was the Star Working Group. So it wasn't the most innovative um, cut of time. But it's now been changed to the Star, star Steering Group, so we see all three levels. Now, the Star Working Group provides the engine for the Star Committee itself. The Star Committee itself meets twice a year. Nothing that happens, nothing has happened in between. So the Star Steering Group provides the engine, the team, to push the Star forward and to get results. I need to mention at the bottom that the Star Foresight Network was also if I don't mention it, L2 will challenge me for the rest of the conference. So there'll be a lot more said about the staff force site mechanism later in the meeting. So this is the, the government, the structure of star with the premier at the top, staff steering group below that. Then below that are a, a number of travel working groups, strategic working groups that take forward topic specific um, activities. In the, in the agriculture, agri-food, bioeconomy area. Um, again, we can see around that, we've got the foresight group, we've got ad hoc working groups and task forces that take time-limited actions forward. And all of this is related to um, advising trade centers, uh, using research area building mechanisms, such as the TSA, we have the target project that supports the, uh, the star, we have area co-fans, we have the great drive. So it's all a part of a, a, a coordination jigsaw in Europe. But the star didn't stay the same as it was in 2005. It's grew to uh, a range of areas outside of agriculture, so it's forestry. So uh, my colleague Keith Finland will share them with you, the trees that I mentioned, the trees and the forests. 
um, and I try to do that on their behalf when they're not at Leeds Leeds as well. But speak to international politics there. So, um, food from uh, the sea, more than just about food from the sea, but the um, environment, um, the whole blue economy, blue bio economy. We've got um, the wider food processing structure, the post farm day activities, which are important in a food system approach. And again, we've got the non food aspects, so the industrial, bio refinery, uh, biofuels, etc. So it's we need a systems approach. Each part of the system has an impact on others, so we need to take forward um, this sort of uh, activity. So all of this is driven by a range of drivers and challenges. So, for example, we have the European Commission's Bioeconomy Strategy that was published in 2012 and recently reviewed a couple of weeks ago, and it's an interesting report from the Commission. And our group at Working Group in Bioeconomy is very much involved in this area. We had FP7 in 2007, followed by Horizon 2020. So, again, major initiatives that have an impact on the scale. We have COP21 and, and the climate aspect, Standard Development Goals, and the European Commission's long term strategy for agricultural research, and more recently, we've had the Food 2030 initiative launched by the European Commission. So, all of these um, issues and drivers that make that scale have to evolve. To um, provide a coordination threat that is, is required um, since 2005. I shall quickly go through what we have in the way of um, working groups. So we have the, the ARCH working group, which looks at bringing closer together agricultural research for development with European agricultural research. We've got the Agricultural Knowledge and Innovation Systems Group. Um, highly important in, in getting the information from research out into the real world. The bioeconomy um, digit working group brought together two existing digit working groups and again provides a, a driver to the uh, bioeconomy strategy in Europe. We've got a digit working group covering fisheries, closely related with common fisheries policy, bringing together those working in the policy area. To develop the, the priorities for fisheries research. Food systems, a digit working group linking that back to the Food 2030 initiative. And finally, we've got the forestry digit working group, again, an important part of the bioeconomy. Underneath that, we've got a couple of standard working groups which are more focused on digit research agenda and joint um, research, animal health, and general animal protection. Just to show the sort of impact that the star has had, there are listed um, some current and earlier um, past and still scheduled working groups, which resulted in a significant number of earmarks in SP7 and Horizon 2020, and tens of millions of euros of joint research funding. So, this is a, a significant um, result from the uh, coordination of the Commission itself. So if we go back to around 2000, that was a kind of landscape in the agricultural and bioeconomy uh, research area for coordination, some of the coordination I'm talking about. Researchers have always been much better at coordination than the funding organisations. So in 2000, there wasn't a lot going on coordination-wise among the funders. I've shown this um, sort of slide from platform um, presentation, so I um, have it full screen for this one. I didn't ask if I could use it, but uh, that's me to be smiling, so I'm not in any trouble. It shows a, a massive uh, development in the coordination among the funders in, in our area of research. Um, we then had the third guide, very important, the third guide, bringing together a higher level of uh, coordination and research program alignment. So it's not all about pay funding, it's about alignment of programs, working better, working more effectively together. Um, we've got um, a lot of current um, staff, digit worker groups and standard worker groups, which I've already pointed out. More recent uh, era, some associated with 
um, vaccines and associated drugs, um, and also inversion networks such as star riders, which is directly linked to star activity in the EIPA group, which um, was mentioned earlier by our, our previous speaker. So we'll have much more on um, star foresight um, later in the day or tomorrow. Um, but that's um, Stefano and uh, Alice to give a presentation on this. I guess to say the, the foresight process provided a strong foundation for the work of STAR, which uh, provided a driver to find establishment of a number of new working groups and federal working groups, and given us the direction, not just for STAR, but for European and uh, international research in the bioeconomy area. Um, and if you want a good read, they're all online and reports from the STAR foresight activity, good um, background and student fees in, in those. Um, I'll summarize now. So we've got a committee of 37 countries, um, all from EU member states, observer countries, and candidate countries, also associated countries. But there's a better need. We need to include certain countries more effectively. We need better representation from countries, and that's one of the major themes of this conference over the next couple of days. How do we uh, bring more participants on board? Um, the EU 13 will be um, a focus, but it, it will pertain to cross member states. The remit of the star is much wider. It's not just about agricultural ministries now, it's not just about research councils related to uh, agriculture and food. We need uh, involvement from ministries and research councils from across um, the spectrum. So it's a, a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary environment we're working in now. So the STAR is a respected source of both on research related to agriculture and the wider bioeconomy. And it's this wider bioeconomy aspect that has implications, as I just mentioned, in representation. How do we bring more people involved in the wider bioeconomy? Um, I have a district in the UK in doing that. I, I talk to a uh, colleague in other ministries where they're extremely busy with their day jobs, they're extremely busy with their uh, work in Europe. How do we um, show them what the impact of working with us in STAR would be? And STAR is also a major catalyst for the coordination of national research programs in helping to stretch the European research area. So we are lucky in our area to have a committee such as STAR. I also work in the SG5 area, the uh, climate action, environment, resources, specific and raw materials. And there isn't an equivalent committee. So we go to a program committee meeting, we have those, we leave them, we don't see each other again. We go to the next program committee meeting where as in STAR, there are many program committee representatives and can link up rise of state policy effectively with the member state national program. It's a, it's a real benefit, I think, for STAR area. Um, so we have much to be gained by improving the alignment of our national research program. Um, I'd like to mention here quickly with APIs. Um, there is a lot of overlap between what STAR does and what some of the third parties do, and there are significant synergies to be gained in bringing the work together and the different coordination activities. So, a word of warning though, coordination isn't always easy, it's quite a tough process and it can be an aging process on people working in the area. So I found this type of this handsome, handsome young man. So, if you go on the search in Google and put in star, lots of photos of, of programs come up. Um, I hardly recognise him, and he's worked in this for quite a few years now, and unfortunately, he's, he's, he's not doing so well on it. He, um, Uh, so another one in uh, photos all over the place. I don't know if he's here today. I know, so I can say what I like about him. Then, if you get there, my uh, my colleague from France, 
He's been working for seven years on this job, uh, an active member. And he, uh, <laughs> that was on one of his uh, old and sad days, so he's not always like that. So, in the, in the literature for the speakers today, the photograph of me on there, I didn't have a photograph of me online. I took off an ATV website, so it's not a very good photograph. I asked Christine to put um, an early photograph of me up there, and as you can see, I haven't changed much since I started working in the I look like that, but inside, I'm like this. So, appearances can be deceptive. But she appears right, so it's, a, it's a fantastic committee to work with. It's um, extremely valuable to work with like minded people who have got similar ambitions and have a focus on getting better value from our uh, research team, getting better value from getting our research out into the real world, working across Europe and wider, and working as a team. It's not about your own country, it's about working as a team to the staff. So hopefully over the next couple of days we can think about how we can do this better, how we can increase our impact, how we can see the benefits of working together spread across all countries, um, and I also hope we all have and you have an interesting and um, stimulating time. Thanks to them for the invitation to come to the meeting from the, the Carta, from um, our host in Estonia, the lovely city. I had a walk around the old town last night. I went out in the rain, went back to my hotel, got dry, went out and in the rain. So I felt really at home. In, in the rain and in the cold. So thank you for providing that as well. Um, and just want to thank you all for being here and thank you for your participation. Thanks, Mike, for the very nice introduction. We'll talk about some questions. One wise man in the same said that uh, to be young is a blessing to be old is a achievement. So, so it's, 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 it's not easy to talk to the world in the future. So, okay, but um, we have next um, to Peter speech now, which will be given by Katrin to the day. So, then we should be able to talk about um, new findings from the invention of the use of different concepts. So, we know that those who do this even. Even wider than in the end, so how can we survive there? I think that's it. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for our Estonian guests who have invited me. Uh, I mean, it's always a pleasure to be invited to Star, and uh, because we, in fact, we're doing very similar things in the OECD to what the Star OECD was doing a few years ago, which is to uh, look at our uh, agricultural innovation systems are working on our government and improve the country. Um, so, we, we will all agree that innovation is very important if you want to meet uh, future challenges and but also realize the opportunities that are there for the uh, food and agriculture uh, system. I guess that's what we call the bioeconomy and the uh, uh, language um, and we think that innovation is really a framework uh, and opportunity for the sector. Uh, the bioeconomy is one example, but also digitalization. Um, so I will go quickly on that because we all know about the challenges. Uh, so what we did in the OECD is we kind of developed a framework. Uh, which consists of a narrative about how the different policy areas uh, can affect the drivers of productivity and sustainability, um, which are innovation, structural change, and resources and climate change. And we applied this framework to a number of uh, country regions, uh, including uh, Estonia, which is more recently. Um, so in this um, I'll tell you a little bit about the framework. Then I'll tell you about um, 
the different characteristics of the reduced countries and the performance. Uh, our innovation can be a driver of productivity and sustainability. Uh, what we can, we, what we found about agricultural policies and the way they can facilitate innovation a lot, and also about agricultural innovation system and innovation policy. We also look at the wider policy environment, and we find in especially in, uh, in more less developed countries that it is very very important because what matters is really to have. Um, a thriving uh, sector, but also um, an environment that enables investment and secure property rights and um, uh, gives access to um, investment um, to land. Uh, and I'll tell you about next step then. So this is what we call our framework. So we look at a lot of policy areas, starting at the top from uh, the wider macroeconomic uh, environment and institutions of government, the idea being that uh, it facilitates investment, uh, trust in the government also. Um, uh, then the, the regulations are important. So then investment, finance and credit and taxation, which are market incentives for investment as well. Then the, the third uh, well, is infrastructure, labor, and education, which affect the cap uh, capacity building and provision of services, agriculture policy, and agricultural innovation system, which are sector specific in some And these policy areas affect the, the drivers, as I told you. And if you want to know more, there's a link to the website where we have all our work. So, in parallel to the, so that's the kind of review that we've uh, done so far. Um, the first uh, seven are public. China and Estonia have been uh, accepted by our committee, so it means they will be published at the beginning of uh, next year. And ongoing are Sweden, Korea, and Latvia, uh, which are well uh, well advanced. So at, before the end of the year, they will be uh, completed. We also looked at the AT system in, um, in Colombia and in South uh, East Asia. And uh, the framework we developed, we can apply it in the OECD, but it's also a tool whereby countries, that, that countries can use themselves, and that's what Switzerland did. Um, so we have, a, we have a narrative about uh, what is the impact of the policy, and then we have a list of questions uh, to clarify how the policy works, and if there is any research and analysis of the impact already. And then we have a list of uh, comparable indicators that are then complemented by national indicators. So, so far with, with, with the countries we covered, we have a very uh, wide diversity of countries. Uh, I think the only one continent we've seen is Africa. But we, and we have like uh, three, four, four uh, European countries, but they're all from Northern Europe. And uh, it would be good to have a better representation of, uh, of European countries in our uh, country review. Uh, we also have Turkey, recently. Um, and they are, they are very different in terms of population. So, Estonia being, being the smallest and China uh, the largest uh, land as well, but with uh, very Smaller European countries and very wide, large uh, uh, China and uh, new Latin countries, sorry, uh, overseas countries, etc. And different level of development and a balance of net exporters and net importers. And a lot of the exporters were exporters of raw commodities, um, except the Netherlands. Um, uh, they are also very different on buildings in terms of natural resources. Here we see land and, and, and water. Uh, with Australia having a lot of land that sources of water, Canada has got both. Uh, this is per capita. Uh, Brazil is doing quite well as well, and Sweden. Uh, and with the uh, countries with a high density of population, uh, like Korea, the Netherlands, China. 
characteristics when we look at the productivity performance. So I will, I will, uh, productivity measurement is very uh, difficult and there's no uh, well recognized measurement that everybody can agree, but we use what has been developed by the Economic Research Service of the USDA uh, using the data. We know it's not perfect, but at the moment it's the only source of uh, comparable data. Um, and what we find is that it's not um, everywhere that productivity, total factor productivity growth is decreasing, or the growth is decreasing. Uh, there are some countries that have achieved uh, very good performance and incre uh, increasingly, like, like Australia is one, uh, but the other the countries like Australia, uh, Canada, and the US, United States, where it's um, not as good as it used to be uh, in the previous uh, decade. So that raised concerns about the sustainability of uh, supplying food uh, for an uh, increasing uh, population. But, but in, in many countries, the issue is not so much about achieving high total factor productivity growth, but doing it sustainably. And there was this issue in uh, most countries is that uh, the, the increase in production and in productivity has been achieved with the more efficient use of resources and that uh, uh, less environmental pr pressure, pressure. So uh, what we call the relative decoupling, it refers to a decline in the ecological intensity per unit of economic output. Uh, so you increase the pressure, but you increase production of productivity more. And resource absolute decoupling refers to a situation in which resource impact declines in absolute terms. So the look at here in this uh, table, you, you look at the pressure in terms of resource and the resource use, but also the, 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 the pollution of the environment. So the only, uh, there, there are few examples of deterioration, but um, in, in general, there, 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 there are improvements, at least in, uh, in, in developed countries. So, our, in, our, in our analysis of country review, we also, we also do an uh, analytical uh, horizontal work, and everywhere we find that the main drivers of total factor productivity growth as, as is often linked to higher uh, labor productivity, linked to the increase in farm size, and also the adoption of labor saving technology, including um, information and communication technology. Um, also, the modern buildings and machinery allow energy saving, better risk management, and lower waste. Um, and, and the adoption of more sustainable practices. And basically, you, uh, you invest, uh, you um, to lower your cost, but at the same time, if you lower the variable input, it's good for sustainability. But, al but also, what is very important is to adopt better management, production, and marketing strategies, and of course, genetic improvement. So, innovation is not only about technology, it's also the whole. Uh, um, practices and interactions with your environment. Uh, of course, the, the, the main reason why uh, farmers are uh, able to turn adopt innovation is to increase profit. But also, if you have the, the appropriate incentives, uh, it can help sustainability and increase profitability but also consumer demand leads to improvement in sustainability. In particular, in, in countries like Canada, for example, the, the reason why they, they improve uh, the, the sustainability performance is mainly due to the retail sector, which uh, uh, demands a certain quality. And of course, when there are market failures, you need policy and regulatory incentives for, um, for that. So in terms of agriculture policy, which is the main uh, work of OECD, you know, 
um, to facilitate inno- innovation, really, uh, because of budget constraints in particular, government needs to invest in areas that yield longer term benefits. And these are infrastructure, education, and certain extension. And it has to exploit also the synergies with the private sector, including in, uh, uh, in the area of research. Um, but the goal goal is to remove impediments to investment, and one of them is linked to the structural adjustment, the fact that the land markets are not always functioning very well, and that the, the, the labor market also is not very uh, good. Uh, in terms of uh, well, to invest in uh, to innovate, you need to also uh, make that you need to have better risk management tools so because innovation doesn't always lead to a certain outcome. But above all, you need to remove the distortions that affect uh, input and uh, uh, output markets so that farmers can exercise a choice of, of input needs, production system, and output. Um, and for example, if you give an, a, a, an input subsidy to a specific input, you force them to ad- adopt a certain technology, and that might, might not be the, the best one in the circumstances. Or if you, um, like in, in uh, Korea or China, you, you privilege the rice, so people are, are kind of produce more rice in areas where it would be more profitable or more sustainable to produce uh, vegetables, fruit and vegetables. So that's in terms of innovation and productivity and sustainability, this is a relatively very um, uh, negative um, result. So um, then in terms of the incentives that you could give to innovation or sustainable practices, then you need to have incentives that are targeted and uh, preferably targeted to results rather than practices if possible. But another big area where government can influence innovation is to facilitate access to information, information about the market, about the technology. Um, <coughs> um, so that's also part of the what we call the innovation system. But in what I call the OECD country, that is the one we, we here is only the one we studied is that most of the support is not going to the general services to, ag- to agriculture, it's going to producers. Um, and and, and um, so that's the gray area. And this support to producers is not very well targeted. In general, a, a, a big part, the blue part, is mostly stuck in support, in particular on the right side. So there you see the European Union is not doing so badly um, because it has a lot, a lot it, it has a large share of um, non less not most distorting support uh, and very wide diverse differences in levels of support as well. Uh, in the service of the public funding and innovation, um, this is the share of uh, Innovation related support, so it's research and development and expansion. Um, that as a share of the, the total of general services support. So, for example, a large majority of general service support is uh, expanded for, for, uh, for innovation and education in Brazil. A majority also in Australia, EU, and Switzerland. But in this country, in Australia and the EU, infrastructure uh, expenditure is also um, a large share, uh, as in Colombia. Uh, in Canada, it's innovation, but also inspection. Uh, and in Turkey and China, it's mainly infrastructure. Uh, in China, there's also a lot of money that is spent on proposing for security reasons. <coughs> Uh, in general, in, in terms of the trends, the, the price support and the subsidies remain important in some countries, but in general, they decline in OECD countries. But you, you see in some emerging economies like China, this, this is increasing. Um, and the, 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 the instruments for producer support are also very different. So 
dans la Libye, sur les Illuminés, avec la politique de faire des actions pour parler de notre société objective. Donc, c'est un risque de l'Allemagne dans les Unités States et le Canada. But in Canada, they include, uh, in the last uh, programming period, they introduced uh, targeted support for innovation. In, um, uh, while in the U.S., you can see that the, uh, that's the market that's guiding innovation. So they don't give, uh, it's one of the few countries that doesn't give in investment support. Because this is people invest if they are supposed to be made. Um, Uh, in Brazil, they support the credit, um, and it's increasing, but it's mainly because the, the credit market uh, in general is, is not functioning very well. Um, they also have introduced some environmental measures, such as zoning, uh, and the support is specific for small, uh, small family farms, uh, including in particular insurance and subsidies and uh, guaranteed price. Um, in Australia, it's mainly uh, based on uh, um, risk management through both drug policy, but they increasingly they try to uh, facilitate that all farmers be responsible for their own risk themselves, and there's no emphasis on general services. So the trend is towards the development of targeted incentives for the adoption of innovation and sustainable technologies and practices. What's important there is to have policies coherent. For example, in some cases, agriculture policies compensate for deficiencies in other policy areas, such as competition or access to loans. In the example is in, is in Brazil. Um, the, question, the question is also should, should agriculture be included in the general policies or does it need specific incentives? So, if, it, if it's part of the general system, We're never sure that agri food will necessarily benefit from general policies. That is, is the case with rural development, but also innovation. Like, in, for example, in New Zealand, the agriculture project competes with the other projects. And in many countries, this is seen as something relatively dangerous for uh, agriculture innovation. Um, there's also support to uh, companies. The question is, do they really benefit agri food uh, companies? We have the issue in Canada, for example, where they, they tell us about all the um, initiatives to develop uh, uh, new sources of financing for innovative firms, but then we have no clue whether really it's for uh, the ICT or, or the, the, the very innovative industries or whether also agriculture uh, agri food benefits it. Um, because often there are issues with the size and the capacity of uh, food companies to uh, access this support and participate in, uh, in a re research and innovation. Um, also, the, it's not like a, a subsidized uh, credit. I think it, it wasn't put in place at a time when we had high interest um, rates. But the policies continue without really an, an, an evaluation of whether this is still needed. Um, so it's very important to have a better understanding of trade-offs and synergies uh, in the different policy objectives so that agriculture policy, innovation policy, rural policy, uh, industrial policy don't contradict each other. So um, then I guess the core of what we're interested in is the agriculture innovation system. We don't call it access because we use the World Bank uh, the, uh, terminology. Um, so there the interaction is very important. You have a wider range of uh, actions. And so it's, 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 uh, it, uh, the, um, it's even more difficult to coordinate. Uh, and their role is different and changing. Um, and the challenge is to make, them, to make the system more responsive to the need. A forward looking, which where the foresight and the size are very important, and more cost effective. So, for, for, from our review, what we find is governance is key. 
um, we have very different interests, institutional structures for public research in the county, uh, in terms of the segmentation, the number of actors, some are basically university or the research institutes, others a mixture of them, some countries have got federal levels. Um, and so, for example, uh, Canada is relatively fragmented, uh, but um, the Netherlands, Brazil, is more uh, concentrated into one big uh, national institute. Uh, and there are lots of efforts to improve go governance, mainly in terms of setting the priorities, setting longer term priorities than just the, 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 the two years that correspond to the funding of projects. Uh, having a better dialogue with stakeholders, for example, in Canada, they develop clusters so that people can talk to each other. Now, the Netherlands has a longer term experience into uh, adding the industry, the education, and the research set together. Um, in terms of policy coherence, in, 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 uh, also, like for example, in, in Estonia, there are lots of strategic documents that evolve, but um, the, 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 the difficulty is to have the, the growth strategy and the innovation strategy being uh, fully aligned, and that's uh, one thing they're working on. Um, but also, we always talk about agricultural research, but we think that. Uh, government also has a role in the governance of extension system. Although they're not supposed to supply all of it, it's important that they make sure that there is a wide access and that farmers get the, the good type of advice they need. Uh, in terms of evaluation, I mean, that's uh, a weak point in general. Um, there, are, there is evaluation of research projects, of researchers, but very little of the system itself. Um, there, there are systems to evaluate policy, for example, in the EU, but also a lot of OECD countries. Um, but not always regular, not sometimes upon request. But the focus is often on assets and outcome, not so much on impact. And also, when you have impact, it's mainly economic, that is with research and PFP. Um, but you also need to take into account the, the, the environmental, the societal uh, uh, aspect. Um, and some countries do it more better than others, like uh, Australia or the US, based on case studies. And INRA has also developed systems recently. Uh, and the EU research project in Chester uh, helps in that. But uh, very often it's the research institute themselves that evaluate themselves. So uh, there, I think, that having evaluation done by peer or uh, by outside. Uh, Independent studies is important, but for research it's difficult because researchers do evaluation very often. Um, so efforts to guide investment according to every priority. Uh, we think that public investment in our energy should focus on public good aspects. So, for example, in the US review, they, they kind of looked at how the public and private sectors were, were matching each other, uh, complementing each other, and uh, to demonstrate that it's the case. Um, but also having, uh, providing targeting the incentive to private investment in, in, in innovation is important. Uh, one aspect is intellectual property rights, targeting investment support, uh, in particular for SMEs, for specific topics. And there are lots of ways to guide investment through funding mechanisms. Again, the role of the government is to pro provide clear information on programs and regulations, market conditions, available technologies. So I say several times that this is very important. What we found in the, in the review is that there's no clear trend in agriculture research intensity uh, as a percentage of value added of agriculture. Uh, in the countries that led this work, they were always claiming that there is a decrease. It's the case in US and um, Australia, but when you look at European countries, it's not at all uh, uh, the case. <coughs> in Korea, for example, also Switzerland. I mean, I don't have Germany here, but Germany is one case where really uh, efforts have uh, increased. Uh, in, in many countries, the government is still the main funder of agricultural research. Uh, 
I think only in the U.S. and the Netherlands we found that there high, was a high private contribution. But in fact, private investment in agricultural research also receives government support. So in the end, the share of the government is, is higher than you might think. And in uh, some countries, you have producer levels that have uh, found the uh, research. So, like in Australia, is the main uh, case where it's a relatively important share. But also in Sweden, they have a foundation. Um, they used to have in the Netherlands, but it has uh, disappeared. Uh, but in general, countries are trying really to uh, find other sources because the government support is uh, usually decreasing. Um, it's very difficult to obtain data, uh, in particular for private expenditures, and in, in a way, it's very difficult to know where the money ends up. Sometimes you know what is the budget of uh, appropriation, but you don't know how it's being used thereafterwards. Uh, my colleagues always ask me, oh, can't you give me the share of uh, agriculture research and for sustainability? And I said, no, I can't. And even for some commodities, you don't know. Uh, so that, I think there's really, I mean, uh, I've been to some meetings and on two years ago and we had the same uh, diagnosis and we hope that we hope that we could do something about it. But <laughs> uh, we could do something about it, but uh, it's really difficult. Um, in terms of the deliveries, there are more project based competitive mechanisms, but also we found that in some countries where they were very high, like Estonia or Sweden, uh, people went backwards and uh, went back reducing the share of uh, uh, project fund, uh, funding because it creates a lot of instability. And also, we need to get support for the long term uh, project. Uh, the fact there was a lot of talk about improving the demand-driven funding, and I think there, there are efforts, but still mainly in the, in the area of thinking about it than, uh, than having uh, a lot of other funds. Um, in some countries, you have the high number of funders, and that makes it complicated for resources to find different sources. That's the case in the U.S. and Sweden, for example. Um, and all this complexity increases the difficulty to trace where the money goes. So um, the other aspect where we insist is, like we do, is the collaboration. This is a widespread objective. Uh, what's required for that is first a good knowledge infrastructure that attracts partners. We think it might be a, what we call a public good. Uh, and it may be a problem in countries where the share of public funding is decreasing. Or it's subject to private participation, like in, um, like in the Netherlands. Uh, when we did the review of, of Estonia, we found that a lot of efforts had, had been made in this area with EU support. Um, so, uh, facilitating knowledge flows helps. So this is the case with the uh, open data, but also stack exchange, uh, uh, and, and then in fact, the incentives for free private investment can be made so that you uh, you give more support to collaborative projects, for example, or you dedicate, you dedicate some uh, funds to that. Uh, very often, uh, the, the the support to uh, Public private partnerships are mechanisms that are not agriculture specific, except in Canada. Um, it, uh, also, the collaborative approaches are important not only for money reasons, but also because uh, some uh, agriculture benefits from innovation in other sectors, like ICTs or environment, water, uh, and multidisciplinary too is important as, as well. Uh, and there, it's there that the public private, private partnership can help, but also network, contact incentives, the sharing of infrastructure and information. Uh, and we made a study on specific mechanisms to uh, foster uh, public private partnerships in those cities. Uh, and the cross country co cooperation, and everybody thinks it's important, but still, it's not very clear how it's being uh, encouraged. Uh, there are some examples, for example, uh, 
the labs in Brazil where they, 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 they run some uh, buildings in, in a research institute abroad. Uh, it's mainly about uh, the movement of uh, students and staff that is, and the participation in the international efforts. There are lots of new networks and uh, like the Global Research Alliance and uh, Greenhouse Gas Emission. G20 has been talking a lot of, about a lot of these uh, initiatives. I went to the NAC meeting recently. Um, so these programs are very important. And in a way, we are leading the way, and it would be very good to have more uh, in clear information about how the, the systems work and that they are shared with a wider range of countries. Um, so what we um, what we found, for example, is that this innovation system is based on collaboration. Um, a lot, of, a lot of it is uh, in the U.S. because uh, they have a strong. Uh, private companies, but very often that the, the capacity of uh, other food industry is a problem. Uh, in, the, in Australia, there's a lot of collaboration because uh, uh, between R&D and extension is co-financed by farmers. Um, uh, in Canada, there are good coordination me mechanisms uh, because there's a large diversity of actors. Um, and in terms of cross-country collaboration, basically the smaller countries usually have more incentives to collaborate. Uh, the Netherlands is the best example, the best uh, because they have both uh, the high capacity uh, and being a member of EU is also very good for the collaboration. Uh, it's also good in Canada and Brazil, less so in Australia because the, the nature of the research is really geared towards their own uh, farmers' problems. Uh, and in the US, you have a size effect, so as a percentage of all research, the collaboration is low, but because they have huge uh, systems, in absolute terms, I guess they, they still do a lot of collaboration. Um, then the issues regarding adoption are widespread. Um, so there, of course, you have the, the in, in, um, you need to improve the extension system, but also you need to improve the enabling environment because it's market which drives the adoption of the innovation. Um, so, for example, the first thing is to um, to get the right skills in the in the sector, and that's where education, training, and extension they need to work together with the industry. Um, it's a challenge in every country, um, maybe less in the US, but uh, still. Um, it's not only about attracting students, but also retaining them in the sector. Um, one, another issue is about fostering innovation culture and societies' acceptance of innovation. And there, one of our indications is the share of people who do science as a degree. And that's an area where Australia is doing very well. Um, and we think that there is a role for the government in extension system in terms of government and also securing that the, the advice for public goods are there. Uh, in terms of the energy environment, uh, you know, we did very quickly at the beginning and um, um, the stability is good for people, right? Um, harmonizing uh, regulations within and across countries when you have federal countries like the US or Australia or Canada, the regulations are different at the federal and at the regional level. Uh, and anticipate regulatory needs, like when you have new products, uh, you need to anticipate the regulation before the product is really ready. Having a single box where people can have information about all the regulations also. Uh, we think that trade facilitates access to uh, new technology and innovation flows. Uh, that we need to address market, market failure and input uh, markets, and particularly financial ones. So, of course, for labor as well. Uh, in terms of taxation incentives, the, uh, of course, the, the, the income tax to companies, but we also look at the tax support for R&D. I think it's better to give direct support because it can be better targeted. Um, and also, it's very difficult to make sure that this uh, 
such with such with, with those really domestic people you 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 would not be able to otherwise. I mean that's not always the case. Um, of course, in for infrastructure improvement, in particular ICT, um, but also um, uh, the labor and education and skills, which I already talked about, and we think long life, long life training is important. And there are some countries that made a lot of efforts in this area, as usual, the Netherlands. And that this um, training should not only be a bit about technology, but also management from raising skills and so on, and collaboration. So the next step in this work is really supposed to be a synthesis report, which will, I guess will be finished by the end of this year. We'll uh, probably have to do a new, uh, new, new country reviews in the uh, next, uh, next year. And we have a few candidates that uh, uh, express their interest, but uh, no firm uh, results. Uh, and we'll also revise the, the, the framework to make, make sure we really cover uh, everything. One issue that is being discussed all, all the time is whether we should include forest school and fishery, because fisheries are part, a part of food, uh, but that would require adaptation. And at this, in parallel, as I said, we do analytical work on the impact of agricultural policies on the environment, on policy trade-offs, on drivers of farm-level performance and taxation policies uh, uh, at the moment. So thank you very much. Sorry I've been too long. And if you want more information, you can look at this uh, website where we post all our uh, related work. And I'm looking forward to uh, collaboration with you. Thank you very much, I so we will have some questions. If not, yes, yes. Thank you so much, sir. Good morning, my name. Good morning, my name is John Hurst, the Minister of Minister of Economic and Minister of Agriculture. My group is Food Quality in Netherlands. The Kaskar is the Food Quality in the Economy. Just a few days ago, you were introducing like the agricultural common policy. With a lot of uh, emphasis on ecosystem, um, trying to make innovation work, um, often a lot of work for member states, how to do that. But my question is if you want to have impact from innovation to this large target without having a huge amount of bureaucracy, how can you steer innovation better? Because I think that's going to be a main topic in the new factor plan. Um, I think that the Commission has already done quite a, a lot of good work, and uh, I guess it will continue. Uh, I think there is less scope for better, co better coordination and collaboration with the EU, but I I, I, I mean, what struck me in the previous presentation is the fact that it's very difficult to understand what's going on in the EU. Even when I started, you know, I was coming much the difference between the uh, uh, not the GPI or uh, the new EIT, uh, the STAR, the new IDM. There's a, the multiplication of networks. Uh, and, and maybe they should be someone who would be, and, and not only in the EU and outside it should even work. And sometimes you get the impression that networks are created just because someone wants to have the own. Uh, so it's already what was done in this presentation before mine was very useful, I think. Um, but to me, innovation really the issue is, is, is the profitability of the sector. So any measure that helps the sector, strengthen the sector itself, really helps innovation. Uh, and if you don't, and that's why the efforts of the EU that to, to have a better coherence between agricultural policy and uh, innovation policy is very welcome. One issue, I think, compared to what we do, is the fact that this GRE is not, is not in charge of uh, food or local food only. And 
uh, in many other locations, we think the problem was not so much agriculture, like in Australia, agriculture is doing quite well. It's the processing. And if the processing doesn't have the capacity to engage in innovation, to market better the products of agriculture, to label them so that they, they get better reputation outside, it's very difficult for the sector to be competitive. And that's why the Netherlands is, is doing quite well. I mean, that's, uh, because ev every segment of the, the puzzle works together and is competitive themselves. So, I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, cl better clarity would be helpful. Thank you. So, there's another question, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. My name is Sudan Langfeller. I'm coming from the research camp of Norway. Uh, my question actually first to um, something which is really in a, a, a driver that changes everything or might change everything, the climate change effect. So I wonder where um, these drivers, these drivers actually coming in in your report, especially the ones that are elaborated at the moment, because it seems that it's all free of climate change issues. Profitability, innovation, production, productivity, profit, everything. But I think many things will change for many countries in the future. So if you could say a few words on your, on your uh, figures. Thank you very much. So climate change is one of the drivers of productivity sustainability. Uh, natural resource and climate change. It will affect them. Uh, and also agriculture can contribute to climate change mitigation. But here in this framework it's more about the adaptation to climate change that we uh, we consider. So when we talk about future challenges, we discuss our climate change will uh, change the future challenges. So a lot of countries will study the deal quite well. The question is will they do as well uh, when there will be less water, when it will be uh, more by uh, um, uh, variability of extreme events uh, and um, and higher average temperature. And for example, in the case of Australia, which could benefit from climate change to some extent, one issue might be more wet, so you need to tell them that they should include the drainage system. And uh, the other one is about livestock uh, disease, because at the moment, the cold winters, they kill a lot of the birds and rats. Uh, so it's on your warmer winter, you will. Uh, maybe country will have the same problem as a uh, more common one. So it's not that it's impossible to go with, but it will increase the cost, it will uh, change a lot, and we need new, 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 new techniques to deal with it, and that's why the training is very important. Thank you. So, of course, not only for the journey, not just to know. So, thank you very much again. And uh, now we have a pleasure to be the first to so, uh, Madame Balavin is the host and is the Minister of Agriculture to present the overview of development of the bioeconomic record here in France. So, please, so we can. So, good morning, everybody. I am a new person to the salon who was not able to come to you to tell you. And uh, hereby, I'm going to give you an overview of the uh, strategy uh, for bioeconomy in France. Um, the development of the bioeconomy in France corresponds to a political win. And in uh, December 2016, the French Prime Minister declared, and it's a quotation, agriculture is also have to, to be less dependent of fossil energy. We still have to rely on a strategy of some plan for the bioeconomy to promote the development of biomaterials, renewable energy production, and the biobased chemistry. 
Um, in January 2017, the strategy was presented at the UN Council of Ministers. It's uh, a meeting where a uh, meeting uh, which gathered uh, all the French uh, ministers. First of all, what, um, why uh, is um, the bioeconomy a strategical key sector in France? The potential of biomass uh, is very important in France, and indeed, agriculture and forestry play a major role in the country. Several value chains of the bioeconomy are already strongly developed uh, in France, or they are emerging. For example, France is the first producer of hemp in Europe, and the new plant is Vanuai. And there are also many innovative processing companies, such as uh, Bio Refinery. Secondly, public and private research and innovation organizations are well involved in the bioeconomy, and they are supported by various a type of public funding. For instance, a wide plan for investment of the future was set up by the French government. Thirdly, various public policies are dedicated uh, to bioeconomy and uh, they are uh, closely related to the sector. And there is a need for integration and combining uh, different initiatives. And the agricultural and the industrial approach must be brought closer. The bioeconomy must create a value for the farmer and guarantee a correct income to the farmer. Bioeconomy is a major sector in the French economy and and in the country as a whole. 61% of total land area are dedicated to agriculture, 28% of total area are covered by forests. 1.9 million jobs are related to agriculture, food, and agri food or bioeconomy in France. Why is it important? to define um, a, a strategic action plan for bioeconomy in France. Firstly, to promote new products and solutions based on innovation for the ecological and energy transition. Bio-based products can contribute to the, to the ecological transition. Secondly, to ensure new economic opportunities for agriculture, forestry, fisheries, and rural territories and the bioeconomy can create new opportunities for farmers. Thirdly, to strengthen the sustainability of the global system, producing food crops and minimizing environmental impact. And France gives a broad definition of the bioeconomy, which includes uh, sustainability, and bioeconomy promotes sustainable modes of production. And there is a need for a global view of bioeconomy, including food and food, materials, energy, and ecosystem services, from research to innovation to economic and territorial development. The next slide shows what uh, bioeconomy can provide. The goal of the French bioeconomy is to respond to all these challenges by bringing together within a systemic vision all activities for bio resource production, supply of processing, product valorization, and the ensuing solution, along with maintenance of ecosystem in the region. Human beings and citizens are central to a new vision in the French approach of the bioeconomy. And how was the bioeconomy strategy built? An initiative was launched in 2015 by four ministries, 
The first one is the Ministry of Agriculture, including food and forestry, and now fishery. And the second one is the Ministry of Environment. The third one is the Ministry of Research. And the fourth one is the Ministry of Economy. And all types of stakeholders were involved in the process. Our partners from research, such as INRA, from industry or NGOs. And here are some principles for the government. Bridging the gap and promoting global equity. Second uh, principle, managing the transition process with stakeholders. Third principle, working at different territorial levels. And bioeconomy must be adapted to the, loco to the local level, it's very important. And a last principle is monitoring the development of the bioeconomy. And now, the main steps of the strategy. The strategy was developed for two years, in 2015 and 2016. On the 18th of January 2017, the strategy was presented during a Council of Ministers. In March 2017, the first strategic committee was led by the Minister of Education, Stefan Lefel. And, in, and since April 2017, the action plan has been consolidated. And um, nowadays, uh, a big conference on food uh, takes place in France. It is called Convention of Food, in Paz de Nouveau de la Limitation in France. And uh, during this convention, a workshop, um, a workshop is organized and is dedicated to uh, bioeconomy. And now I'd like to present uh, some important measures in favor of the bioeconomy in France and in Europe. Uh, first measure, uh, to facilitate uh, the penetration of bio-based products on the market, standards and certification uh, should be promoted, and a label has been, has been created. Second measure, um, it is um, to build an uh, innovative industrial ecosystem uh, in order to uh, strengthen links between first aid production and processing. And it is important to encourage innovative processing companies. A third um, measure uh, is to promote solutions to produce more and better thanks to agroecology. A fourth measure is to evaluate positive and negative impacts of bioeconomy. And in France, a study of the positive uh, externalities of the bioeconomy was carried out. A, a fifth measure is the dialogue, the dialogue with the society. A wise communication a campaign is needed in order to make citizens aware of what bioeconomy is. And a sixth measure um, is related to research and innovation. It is important to inform uh, targeted research. It is important to promote cross sectoral and territorial research and innovation aspects of the bioeconomy. And to conclude, uh, what are the lessons learned? learned? Uh, bioeconomy uh, products. Uh, must become a source of informed transformers. It's a big challenge. Uh, the uptake of that matter is not ensured uh, in some regions, and there is uh, a need for a big, a wide communication campaign, and it's a major uh, bottleneck. Some technicians from the Ministry of Agriculture were trained and uh, at INRA, it's a big uh, research institute on agriculture in France, um, bioeconomy is an important uh, axis, and it, it is um, an action uh, which, uh, could ha which um, has been taken. And now uh, 
I'd like to launch uh, some recommendations. Um, the ministry, the, the strategy must be shared by several uh, ministries, four and five. The strategy must be adapted to the local level. It's very, very relevant. The bioeconomy must become something uh, optional for uh, the citizens. Bioeconomy must be developed uh, on the long term at regional, uh, national, and uh, European uh, level. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. From the from the question, it seems that the presentation was awesome. This is the most interesting. Okay. My name is Kim Benjamin from Norway. My question is about your bioeconomy uh, strategy in France. What has specific global uh, aspects of the bioeconomy incorporated in in your country strategy? Um, could, could you be more uh, precise, please, uh, Christian? Your question was a pilot, a pilot scheme. Yes, for uh, farming sector. I, I don't understand your question. Thank <laughs> you. My question is about um, in, in your buying economy strategy, yes. it's, it's about the trade, but it's also about uh, the speed of the product. Yes. And how then uh, international trade plays an aspect in that? Uh, all and most the other strategies yes, that are um, It's related to, to trade. Uh, all, all actors uh, are involved in, in, in the definition of the strategy. And um, the company uh, must uh, import export more and more. And um, we have uh, also international stakeholders uh, in the research institute. And uh, everyone is involved. And we try to involve everyone. It's the research I can do. I can, I can Thank you. And then questions for. Thank you again. Oh, there's one question. Thank you. I'm John Angus, who is from Biotech and Mass Agriculture for some post of person. Uh, I wonder uh, one issue very much. Uh, it's a very difficult to gather all uh, the, uh, these ministries together. Uh, how did you achieve this? Thank you very much. So, maybe uh, uh, first you build a core group uh, for growth interest. Uh, it, 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 it was not easy, but uh, you managed. And um, uh, in every ministry, uh, there is an office uh, which is in charge of bioeconomy. And we have contacted uh, this person, and we have organized uh, a meeting. And um, the first meeting was a success, and afterwards we organized uh, several meetings, and we discussed, we discussed, and uh, at least uh, there was um, a, a consent of um, um, on the action plan, and uh, and it was a key factor. And uh, the ministries uh, know um, when when they are not uh, when they don't agree on the common strategy. It's impossible to achieve uh, something. Uh, I would like to thank you for, for this uh, achievement. <laughs> thank you. It, it was not easy. Okay. Thank you. There's one more question for you. My, my question is a follow up to that question. My question is a follow up to your question. Uh, my question is a follow up to the first one. Uh, how is the French bioeconomy strategy uh, connected to EU strategies in this area? And for example, the bio based uh, label, is it a pure French one or is it uh, something that you want to promote uh, uh, at the EU level or international level? And I guess the question also from the, from the first. Um, uh, Question was about the, the whether the strategy was purely French. Like, um, for example, do you allow for importing raw materials or bioeconomy from other products? What would be the 
participation in strategy as a support strategy in this context that you, you, you would call for biomass from somewhere else. So I'm not from uh, the office of the bioeconomy of the ministry, but I try to, to answer, to reply. Uh, the label is a French one, it's true. And uh, I don't know if the ministry wants to uh, exchange uh, this label, uh, I don't know. And, um, and uh, perhaps um, biomass will be important, perhaps, but we have um, less uh, biomass in France. But I think um, France less uh, important biomass, I, I don't know exactly. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not uh, a specialist of the question so far. So far. Thank you very much again. So we can't uh, participate more questions. So now the next speaker is uh, Myra Hansen from the other States. She will tell you something about the uh, Irish bioeconomic structure. Please, very good. Good morning, everybody. Um, one of the things that struck me this morning about Ms. Kilometer's uh, presentation, the Director General of the Executive uh, General of the Ministry of Rural Affairs, Ms. Jenny, who said that the smartness of resources in the small countries are important. So it's a very much an honor here to talk about how we're looking at that issue in Ireland in terms of the bioeconomy. We, just, we can't force it right, so we can't force it wrong. Um, so it's, 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 it's an honor to be talking about uh, how a small, another small country is looking at the smart use of resources. Um, I suppose just to explain first of all why I'm here. Um, I come from an old agricultural, it's the, from Cardiff, it's the um, Agricultural and Food Development Authority in Ireland. It's an organisation that operates um, under the aegis of the our Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, or the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, and unfortunately, the Ministry of Agriculture couldn't be here today, so I, this presentation was developed in consultation with them. Um, I suppose there's another point to make it. I'm somewhat here on the fault of the country. We haven't developed the bioeconomy strategy in Ireland. And we're not actually working on developing the bioeconomy strategy in Ireland at the minute. But what, we're, what we will be doing in the next week or two, certainly in this, within this month, is launching a national bioeconomy policy statement. And so that's what I'm going to explain to you as a part of the round off. Um, so I think um, we very much recognize the importance that, you know, obviously there is an EU bioeconomy strategy um, available, but we recognize that, you know, each country has to develop its own position within that. We all have our own um, particular peculiarities in terms of capacities and natural resources and inputs to it from bio-based materials and that. But we also felt it was important to get a steer um, nationally in terms of where things are going to go, but also be a very important signal externally in terms of kind of the, the statement of, in, in, uh, statement of intent nationally within Ireland. If we recognise the bioeconomy as an opportunity for Ireland, we recognise that it's, we're going to develop a support framework around the bioeconomy and that we're very much open to investment in relation to the bioeconomy as well. So there was that dual objective. So the, the, the signaling internally in terms of trying to bring policy coherence and the signaling externally in terms of being open to business for investment in the space. So we recognise that it obviously isn't an easy um, thing to do. We recognise that we're going to be uh, in potential for conflicts of interest, for example, with the cost, economic, social and environmental objectives. Obviously there's competition for natural resources in terms of food, food, fuel and fibre and there were challenges in terms of trying to align um, objectives and interests in that regard. And also, obviously, with regard to any policy intervention, there's always the potential for unintended and unforeseen consequences. But when, when we weren't starting from a blank slate, we had a number of related policies, a number of policies that were already developed that were worked across sectors. They were particularly focused on issues of sustainability and the, the opportunities that are available within the, the green kind of economy space. Um, and we also recognize the potential of waste. So these policy documents were already in place and I suppose provided some of the, the underpinning um, directions in terms of, of where they were going. We also had a number of strategies and documents at sectoral level. And here we had um, strategies around uh, forest uh, and forest products. We had um, strategies around uh, the marine and ocean wealth. We had a draft bioeconomy strategy or bioenergy strategy. We had um, ocean energy. We had a, a food-wise, agriculture and food-wise strategy up to 2025 as well. So a lot going on in, in the policy space and strategy space already. 
They even had a number of um, so just focusing on the energy sector. They even had a number of plants too that work work down below energy and work down to different um, scales of energy as well within Ireland. So if we look um, here, this one here, this brings the, the the local authority in terms of renewable energy. So even a small country like Ireland is very conscious of the need to bring things down to, to regional level as well in terms of how how we are operating. So when we were starting to develop the, the national value economy policy statement, we were very conscious of the complexity of the policy space within uh, which the value economy is situated. As I said, we had the, the objective, the, the um, issues around the policies for food, food, food and fiber. But then we do to that with policies related to economic policies, social policies, environmental policies. A lot of things happen at national level. But the way we are going to things that are happening at more international and global level as well. So a very complex policy space um, with, uh, within the environment, within the within the developed and national value economy policy statement. And this uh, this next point I suppose resonates in terms of the question in terms of how you bring ministries together because the who who leads the value economy statement very much influence where the funding is prioritized and then ultimately who are the winners and the losers in relation to value economy. And this was a table produced by the uh, German Bioeconomy Council, and they looked at who were the main actors and how does that impact on the key funding areas in relation to bioeconomy. Then, and you can see that there are some differences in terms of who is leading and then where, where the priorities are in terms of, of funding. So, one of the key things that, that um, was significant in terms of developing the starting with the development of the bioeconomy policy statement in Ireland was actually um, a competitive funding pair by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine in 2014. And they funded a research project known as BioAira. And I suppose this, in terms of style, there's actually a very good news story there. Um, Richard Powell, who was one of the key people within the research division within the Agricultural Ministry, he would have been very active at EU level. He would have recognised the opportunities that the bioeconomy presented and recognised the need to, uh, for research projects around looking at the developing the underpinning knowledge for ultimately for a bioeconomy strategy. So that was a very significant um, action taken, and I suppose I can take some credit for that because I actually coordinated that bioeconomy project. And uh, my colleague Laura Devani was a co-staff on that. So, the, so we developed the, the, the underpinning knowledge, identified priority value chains for the development of the bioeconomy for the future. So that, that happened even before things kind of were, I suppose, documented at policy level, specifically in terms of the bioeconomy. As I said, we had a number of policy documents that were related to bioeconomy, but nothing um, as of 2014 that at policy level specifically mentioned the bioeconomy. Then I suppose a very significant thing in terms of the policy coherence and the bringing the different ministries together was the specific um, documentation of the bioeconomy and the National Action Plan for Jobs in 2016. And that was significant because the National Action Plan for Jobs was housed in the Department of the Future, which is our Prime Minister's office. So there was an overarching coordination automatically in terms of where, where it was going. The most significant um, documentation at policy level in terms of the potential of the bioeconomy was in the National Action Plan for Rural Development. And that's where this very long um, winded government department here is the Department of Arts, Heritage, Regional, Rural and Business Affairs. So there was another ministry starting to come on board in relation to the bioeconomy in 2017. And ultimately, where that came to resulted in the whole of government approach led by the Department of the Future, there was our, our Prime Minister's office. That was set up, there was an interdepartmental group set up in Q4 2016 to look at the um, potential for developing national policy statements, the potential for developing kind of an overarching um, vision, uh, key principles, and strategic objectives for the bioeconomy. And that was in Q4 uh, 2016. So, what has happened since then? These are the specific actions that are documented in relation to the bioeconomy in the action plan and the, in the world development. And we uh, suggested the establishment of a baseline assessment of the current bioeconomy activities and opportunities across the various sectors in Ireland. And that, as I said, it, it was led by the Department of the Future and including other sectoral departments. So there was very much the coordinating role of the Prime Minister's office there. Um, that has been done, and they actually found that there were about 83 current or um, forthcoming initiatives in relation to bioeconomy already taking place. Um, under the aegis of the, the various sectoral departments. These included um, uh, research, science and engineering projects, uh, projects around consumer awareness, um, infrastructure development, and uh, policy initiatives as well. So, 
I think that's the first time it's talked about the way it's true in this book already on the way. Then in 2, 1, 24, turning the objective of the whole of comfort, the stamina, and the buying economy with two stakeholders, including the development agencies and the private sector. And that was actually joined again um, by the Department of the Teachers and the Cardiff, my parents' department, and our parents' organization, which is housed within the Department of Agriculture. So even though this is very much led by the Department of the Teachers, I think the, the kind of interest by the agricultural sector in that host and that joint event is very significant in terms of seeing where the bioeconomy and policy statement is going. So that happened in February 2014. Since then, uh, there was a discussion document prepared by the Department of the Teachers um, and involving these departmental groups, and they um, produced that uh, discussion document uh, as funded for, consult- for public consultation, and the consultation process on that was closed in September. And the objective now is to develop is to publish a, high, sorry, is to publish a high-level policy statement on the bioeconomy in Ireland. That hasn't yet happened, but the draft uh, bioeconomy policy statement has been produced. It's been discussed by the interdepartmental group. It's been sent back to the various ministries to sign a comment, and it's expected to be presented to government um, next week. So it will certainly happen in 2017. So in terms of public consultation, which is this document here, which was issued, there were actually, in addition, we had the stakeholder consultation exercise in February, that workshop, but the, the public consultation also resulted in 51 submissions. And I think just looking at the profile of organisations that made submissions, it's very interesting to see, obviously, that the academic and research centres are very much on board here, but also personal commercial entities took the trouble to make um, submissions. So we have um, a number of the, the big companies, we have some of the forestry organisations, the representative bodies for farmers, the representative bodies for industry, all making um, submissions as well. And also, the three of the local authorities make submissions as well. So I think it's very clear that the active involvement or active interest in this space across all the, the, the relevant stakeholders. So, as I said, the, the, the draft statement has been presented to the interdepartmental group um, and, the, and it's going to be presented to government for approval. There are obviously the high level implementation groups um, bringing forward this national policy statement. And so the, it's unlikely that the um, Department of our Prime Minister's Office are going to lead us, but it's quite likely to be co chair between two um, of, of the ministries. Um, and it's, it's, well, I've seen the document just, I suppose, just in terms of where it's been positioned, it's very much been positioned as something that's offering the uh, potential to bring the economy to a post carbon economy um, and providing jobs and opportunities for uh, rural areas. I'm very much emphasizing the opportunity for indigenous to the, um, innovation within Ireland as well, very much using our own, our own national resources. And also, even though it's very much kind of based on agriculture and using our own natural resources, very much recognize the potential for innovative technologies to, to help to support the development of the bioeconomy in Ireland. So uh, that's just, just acknowledging um, BioAir and Carlton as well in terms of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for very clear and for detailed some of your very clear description. Thank you for your presentation. I wish you for a long uh, very good uh, work for your future. But I would like to, to propose that to look at the other national uh, strategic uh, bi- uh, strategy on bioeconomy, which we're going to take in our plenary in June uh, uh, with the science. Uh, and uh, so it was an effort to immediately task because uh, we, we, we had uh, to, uh, to keep it together in many ministries and in, this, and in our uh, in Italy we, we had uh, this uh, process under the uh, Ministry for uh, Cohesion uh, Policies and uh, so uh, last in 2017 in April we launched uh, our national strategy to make it yeah, yeah, that's a surprise because we know, I mean, we're not uh, aware of that. Oh, no, that was a 2015 slide prepared by the German Bioeconomy Council, but yes, France and Italy and others have also since then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it's just interesting. Thank you. Well, thank you for this presentation. Any other questions? Let's see. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mr. Sinnenberg from the Australian Ministry of Agriculture and Environment. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, 
it was quite interesting. Also, it was a bit difficult for us as non-native speaking English because we were so fast in, in, in the presentation. And my question would be about the role of research and innovation in, in this plan. Um, and and uh, referring to the last uh, question from the previous presentation of Frank, uh, a second question, how do you see uh, the Irish uh, plan related to the European bioeconomy mm -hmm. privacy review? Okay. okay, in terms of research innovation, we would very much see research innovation as being central um, to the implement. Now, it's, I suppose it's not a plan yet, it's a, it's a national bioeconomy policy statement, so it's not in an extent the plan level. But the, the research teams are very actively engaged, and I think the fact that we have actually developed a, a national policy statement goes to our, the, we have an organization called Science Foundation Ireland, which funds basic research within Ireland. And they have recently um, given funding for 17 million uh, research centers around the bioeconomy called Ethan. So I think the fact that we were developing a national policy statement gave Science Foundation Ireland the confidence to invest 17 million in that space. And obviously, with the Department of Development Culture and Education, it would have been influential in the sense in um, that funding um, as well. So, we also have a number of um, well, coordinating uh, agro sites, which is a big EU Horizon 2020 project. Uh, we're involved in projects such as Casa and Agro for Valor. Um, uh, and we're involved in projects um, in terms of that are funded by the BBIJU, um, the, the chair of the scientific committee of the BBIJU at the moment. So I think uh, as a country, we very much see research innovation as being central to the bioeconomy. An organization like Cardiff, we would see innovation as being central to the bioeconomy. And I think it's explicit as well in terms of the, the, the uh, ministries that are going to be involved and the people who are involved that innovation will be central to the development of the bioeconomy. Going back to the link with the EU bioeconomy strategy, I, you know, obviously we would be conscious of the fact that the national strategy has to align with the EU strategy, but equally because of our particular national resource base, it would be somewhat um, unique to Ireland, but the national bioeconomy policy statement was very much conscious of looking at our own national resources, but also being very quick in uh, connecting into what's happening at the EU level. So, and it even is how Ireland works within the EU. So we're, we're always conscious of implementing at EU level, and uh, I think that is that that would be a, a core part of how we bring it forward. And also in terms of developing products, we would be very much export oriented and looking to beyond kind of our, our national borders, looking beyond even the EU as well in terms of where we'd be going with it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, just one more question. Brussels, so 
also ventures to techniques such as SMEs or companies that can invite the SMEs themselves. And in the way, it's exciting, but it turned out to be a very nice occasion, and uh, we had a lot of consequences coming back from it. So it was a really a participatory workshop, um, and just I introduced it as a friend of the SME, and uh, we sort of asked them at the end, and they were quite satisfied with the outcome, so they had their value coming up from the workshop as well. So the objective of the workshop was to discuss, formulate recommendations, and reach best, best, best practices. Um, many challenges, opportunities, and, and collaboration and collaborative innovation. So not just existed as some innovation, but collaborative innovation. And how the knowledge flow and the actions uh, among them can be supported. Cost stabilization with the other parts of the, uh, of the value chain uh, around them, supply chain around them, and how uh, they can understand consumer expectation more and market opportunities and challenges. So very complex themes. So there were four presentations set in this theme. Um, the first two, my cooperation again, uh, was presented by Byron Arakat and Rob Peters, the DITB DTAG. Why is it important? Why should SME agree to the SME say? And which system approach is important? And there was the research of innovation. The second one was by me, I'm afraid. Um, and I had to collect a lot of data and a lot of information how every food SME is innovating in Europe. And basically, the short answer is that they don't. Uh, if they are not funded for innovation, so if they are not found a, a startup that traditional agri food SME, they try to be fair in the market and try to, uh, to make their, um, their business uh, profitable. So it is very nice to hear that uh, profit and cost and income are the main source for innovation. So it's very difficult. That was my, uh, the sum of my presentation. Uh, then we heard two good examples. Uh, how can we uh, support agri-food SME innovation in a systemic way? The first one was from Portugal, a crop-up initiative which combines uh, ICT startups and agri-food SME and has uh, developed a program for them to cooperate and to come up with some nice new nice solutions. And the second one was from Flanders Food. Um, how um, a complex type of working can help agri food SMEs to receive uh, innovative practices. Then, we listened to the agri food SMEs. We had four sections, and they had a small, uh, all of them had the possibility to give a short speech type of uh, presentation, five to uh, ten minutes, and then we could ask them. Uh, and I really, really brought home a lot of um, good ideas. For the next 10 years, at least. So basically, this was about distribution channel, value chains, uh, sales model, production processes, and then technology. And then we went on being a nice workshop and uh, having a lot of group chats and uh, discussions about things. And the first two was what and who. So discussing co creating uh, innovation. So, how to innovate together in a cooperation without getting very old at the beginning. And first of them that, um, that came out, and it's a very nice uh, summary because at the end we had a huge wall like this with full of little um, uh, comments. So, I'm, I'm really, um, uh, it was really a successful summary in this slide. Um, first, multi actor innovation clusters, a similar, similar innovative activity by interaction, sharing facilities to be at the same place, uh, doing things together, and then networking, then connecting agri food SME uh, to other parts of the food chain, which is not a uh, natural thing. You would think it is, but it's not. Um, and also, sometimes they uh, get very far from the consumer. So what the consumer needs, uh, sometimes it's not very obvious for them. So putting them up with consumers is also something very crucial uh, coming up from the discussion. And then, to create a better understanding of interconnection, um, how these new linkings and cooperations can work, 
And then it's very important to look at the locality where they were. If they work in a nice environment and there is no uh, municipality level, it's much easier for them. If they work in a non cooperative or even in a hostile uh, local environment. And then also, we discussed a lot um, on the instruments of public private action and how to enhance the innovative ecosystem for the innovation and research community around uh, the SME. We have a lot of tools, we heard that in passing, but it's sometimes not clear, it's sometimes probably too many. Uh, but it's uh, very important that, that these aggressive SMEs uh, have some kind of map where to go and how to get help. And then it's very nice that who will help and what to do, but then how. Uh, we already heard that knowledge, developing skills, expertise, and competence, nothing new, is very, very important. But it was nice to hear from the other two SMEs themselves that they think it's important. And um, it's very important to provide the, the, the right funding for this type of development. Um, we also came back to the good examples of standard school that, that a good support infrastructure is very helpful. This is there. You look at how your network and hubs there on regional, national, and even on EU level. The connection to all of the existing hubs is also something very important. And then it's very important to meet physically. So sometimes the coffee breaks and the dinner and lunch times are more important in networking than the conference itself. And we shouldn't uh, forget that, and we should leave space for that kind of uh, development. And then um, it's very important to uh, focus on knowledge exchange and demonstration at, at, at even across borders. So farmers and other students believe in things, believe in innovation, if they can look at it, if they can touch it. And if they can, if they can try it out, and sometimes they believe more somebody who is in another country than uh, the neighbor. Sometimes they believe the neighbors more than the advisors. So it's a difficult context. Right? But EIT is, I think, doing a great job to help that. And then uh, I will just come up. We'll come up to the speakers and maybe uh, two, two discussion points for the coffee break and lunch time and the dinner time. So it's just for successful collaboration for SMEs and uh, other participants in the workshop. Trust, transparency, and expectations. Every two SMEs are working in a highly competitive environment from the input and from the retailer has to their side. So they are sometimes very busy with the SMEs. So trust from the beginning of the innovation process and uh, defining what is your um, value proposition from this innovation, what is mine. From the beginning, is very important. In transparency about data and research results, and what innovation results, and just to make it clear from the beginning who owns what, it's very important. Team facilitation, so that always somebody always needs to be, as they say, the spider in the web, so that someone who gets very old at the end and uh, looks quite uh, worn at the end, so who knows everybody, who is trusted by everybody. Uh, sometimes it's just a person, sometimes it's an institution. Uh, the best combination when there are a lot of persons and trusted institutions. So somebody um, needs to be in the middle. And then it's very important to have a win win, uh, even between the, uh, the partners in the value chain, and also from an economical and a social impact point. So just to hear that there is climate change, it's not just profits and costs. Uh, an economic, it's, it's very important to have the, the social impact side and, and to innovate something which is at least acceptable from different uh, points of view. Potential solutions, improved possibilities for exchange of data, information in the other system. It's very difficult. My institution is just uh, doing that in Hungary and it's just as really difficult than having a bioeconomic strategy and, and putting ministries into the same table. A right funding in the right phase of the innovation process, because just as we heard that we have a lot of source of funding, but to find the, the right funding at the end, the right moment, uh, it's, it's, it's a science uh, on its own. And unfortunately, as for approach, the optimal combination of equipment and skills, uh, there has to be a lot of partners around the table to, to get a good solution for the, for the problem. 
and I tried to support the similar collaboration. collaboration. Um, we need to build a system, which is in some countries it's already there, in some countries it's not, and like some countries are in between. And the EU is, I think, in between. So we have a lot of elements, uh, but, the, but the innovation ecosystem, even with the EIP, is just starting to uh, perform. Policy and regulation to foster cooperation and level playing field and clear committee. What we found in the workshop uh, that, uh, just as uh, we already heard, that for farmers it's quite clear. A lot of regulations, but still it's quite clear. But for the food uh, part, the agri food part uh, of, uh, of the economy, and because uh, we are serving consumers directly, they have even more regulations, and sometimes the regulatory environment is not clear for them. Sometimes it's in, uh, motivating them to innovate, but sometimes it's, uh, it's just uh, uh, an, ob um, an obstacle to innovation. So maybe, probably, uh, the policy can go to a different kind of procurement system to motivate them, or to have a special advisory system for that. And then a financial support to prepare innovation projects. So before uh, starting a successful innovation in the value chain, it's very important to prepare every food that you need for that. Because just as I started my uh, presentation, from their own, they don't innovate. It's not in their everyday business. So thank you very much. <laughs> but now, uh, do you have some questions for, for the first presentation, or you hear me out the two presentations and then combine? Which two? Yeah, the first two questions after the second question. After the second question. Yeah. Alright. Okay. So, uh, probably some of you already heard this presentation. I'm sorry uh, for this, but I try not to be the same this time. Uh, so this is a presentation about another uh, activity we did in a charity group. Uh, my colleagues developed two policy groups. I was just starting to be an active uh, part uh, of the ASIC group at the end of this process. So it's basically the job uh, of, of my colleagues. And these two policy groups are different about two very important elements of the ASIC system, how to develop it is the advisory services and education system. And I hope that after the presentation you will agree with me. So, and then a picture, more personal picture. This picture was taken by me. And actually this is a free ACIC action. Um, it's a soybean field. And it's a program organized by the Association. So I will have some free tree in the picture. I'm not in the picture, I was taking the picture. So the first is the farmer. We have a lot of farmers. And the second is the association, the Soy Growers Association of Hungary. They organize the meeting. And there, there is the advisor with the microphone telling the nice knowledge and asking questions. And, and he received a lot of very difficult questions during this meeting. He did it. And there, the four is researcher, is my colleague. Uh, she's doing research on the protein content of soy. And five is the journalist, online journalist, making a very, very nice report after the meeting. Why is this important? Because um, this meeting was organized because there is a problem coming for soy production. Soy production is not a traditional production in Hungary. We are just in the upper limit of the climate uh, area where soy uh, can be produced. So climate change is good for our soybean producers. But because it's not a traditional product, we do not have a traditional feeling of technology uh, in, with the farmers. So they are just starting to learn it. So they are not very good at it at this point. But the ecological focus area and the regulation about it uh, gives a boost to soybean production because in other areas you can produce soybean. And also we have uh, voluntary capital support payment for soybean. So two incentives from the regulatory side to produce soybean. So they started to produce a lot of soybeans in Hungary. And then the new regulation of FSA areas just prohibited uh, pesticide use on FSA areas. So the question was, nice slide from the year, what will it cost 
my lady being better than this field, so let's take a concrete uh, comment. And what about without pesticides? How can we do that without pesticides? So these few, uh, really, this advisor had a disapproval from her. So, but this event uh, is a symbol for me of ATIS, a good ATIS. Everybody was there, what was the problem? And they uh, tried to come up with a solution. And it's the classic of uh, figure of ATIS. So, what you saw in the picture before is here in a more systematic way. Farm is in the middle. And um, what you see in ATIS is active, so all actors in the picture, direct, and I'm reading after. And also, but it's more important, the objective is that it's not just that the people being there, or the actors being there, but to improve knowledge flow and closing the innovation gap. But it's easier said than done, because what we think that there are multiple gaps uh, in the knowledge system. Uh, even farmers and sometimes are not speaking the same language or don't have the same um, ideas about things. But if you think of knowledge providers, researchers, innovators, public administration, society, and business partners, we are definitely not speaking the same language, not even in a country. And uh, when we are talking about different countries, that is even more difficult. For example, in Hungary, 51% of the farmers do not cooperate at all. And the average number of cooperative links link of a farmer is 2.5 on her. How to do research in the whole value chain? It's coming out from a research, a cooperative research between the Academy of uh, Hungarian Academy of uh, Agriculture, uh, the Chamber of Agriculture, and our institute. So, um, so for these bridges, you need uh, bridges for the gap. So, so you need bridges for the gap. What is the problem with bridges? It's trust. First of all, the problem is trust. This is also coming from the same research. With trust, we have two issues. One is can we do? So, are you a professional? And the second one is will you do? Will you be there when I need your advice? So, and according to our farmers, um, most of them are mistrust, everybody around uh, them. So, we cannot do them and we won't do them. But the second most important uh, group for trust that they trust that we can do and we will do. So it's not hopeless, but it's a very difficult situation. And what we think in it is that with the, with the green building, uh, you need to have soft skills to improve the soft skills. And with the you can do side, you have to improve hard skills. Some of the farmers are really professional in, in a legal detailed way. So if you do not, if you are not on the same level with them, they don't trust you anymore. And the other thing is that bridges, these kind of trusted bridges, need to be connected on national level and on international level as well. Active networks, common resources, knowledge cross fertilization, and systemic thinking are uh, very nice words, but it's, again, it's very difficult to do. And what we think, and what we develop in this policy group, is that we think that advisory systems, uh, services, and education systems are really the key. Uh, to bridge these gaps. And, okay, yeah. and we need advisors embedded in ATIS, and I'll click on that, so it's coming from the one of our policy groups. Uh, advisory services need to be high on the political, political agenda. This presentation was uh, prepared before uh, the communication on the FNF CATIS came out, so we are very happy now that it's high on the political agenda. But they need to be interconnected, they need to be interactive role in the project, and they need to be embedded in ATIS. And there are key recommendations. They need to have some kind of back office services for them, and a hard and a soft infrastructure, because otherwise they won't be trusted by the farmers. And so, we need to train advisors better. And about good education practices, uh, at this policy group, we just started to collect good practices because uh, really education is really far from the GRT and the uh, agri, so we really try to make impressions with good practices. And we concentrated, my colleagues concentrated on the link between the different actors in ATIS in education, so between researchers and teachers, 
between researchers and applied advice, academic advice, and uh, building advisory practices. They would like to have these practices how to develop their educational practices and policy decision. And I think we should do that soon. Uh, maybe when we will have this nice group which is love taking in Paris. And uh, thank you for your attention. Now I will have your question. Okay, thank you, Agnes. And we're going to take comments from the first person. for this very good presentation. Uh, and yes, as far as I was expecting that we are doing very similar things to what the OECD is doing, uh, but I, I think it's a pity we're not doing it together. <laughs> and uh, especially given that what we need to make the OECD work is better EU representation. And our delegate to the Commission in OECD is always uh, looking for strengthening the links as far as what succeeded so far. Uh, my question is about the collaboration in SMEs. Did I just, did you discuss the issue of collaboration and competition? Because if you're talking about competitive research, there is an issue uh, if you have two, several uh, uh, companies uh, collaborating, or are you thinking about collaboration for free competitive research? I mean, did you discuss that kind of issue? I think collaboration and cooperation and uh, competitiveness came up a lot. Um, but I think um, it is probably in case of product development, it's more um, specific and important issue for the SMEs. In case of system development and value chain development, uh, I think cooperation is already existing, so it's already very important. So I did not feel it's very um, frightening atmosphere that it's mine, it's my IPR and so on, because we were really talking about systems and value chains. So I think in that case, cooperation, they, they already understand that cooperation is important, but they are not used to cooperation in innovation. So cooperation in value chains is something they are getting used to. Cooperation in innovation is something um, I think we should strengthen. That's why we were uh, talking about uh, um, preparing them for innovation and cooperative innovation before starting the project. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And we can go to the next presentation. And then I'll give the floor to Stefan Dawson to present the policy document for SDC Paris and Thank you. Thank you to the Estonian uh, presidency and the organizers uh, of the conference to give us from the Bioeconomy Strategic Working Group uh, the opportunity to briefly present uh, our policy advice uh, that we prepared or are still in the process of preparing to the European Commission, especially. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, in order for us to get some lunch quite soon. So, uh, there are two policy documents that I want to talk to you about. One is on the revision of the bioeconomy strategy, and the other is on the relationship between the bioeconomy and the circular economy, and how we, as the bioeconomy strategic working group, see um, this relationship uh, currently and hopefully in the future. So, the policy brief on the future of the bioeconomy strategy is already finalized and it's available on our website so you can download it there and have a look at it. Um, and the technical note, as we call it, which is basically an addendum uh, of our policy brief on the relationship between the bioeconomy and the circular economy, it still needs, still needs to be finalized. The staff plenary will meet uh, on Wednesday and we hope that we will get some feedback from the delegates in the staff plenary that we can then use to finalize the document uh, and then uh, put it also on the web page and hopefully also have it translated by DG Translate into maybe French and uh, German uh, or some other language, maybe Estonian, if there's a way to do that. Um, so just briefly, um, we have a discussion in February 
uh, among supporting member states and associated countries that were present at the meeting in Paris to really talk about what we want to see in the Biden economy strategy review. And uh, we had them do some homework, present the results, and then discuss amongst ourselves for two days. And then as a follow up activity, there was a small writing team um, that then uh, finalized uh, everything, put it all together into one document. And I just want to present this slide here because it gives the outline of the policy document. Uh, the need that we see for a new or updated bioeconomy strategy and action plan from our perspective. Very important definition of the bioeconomy. There are still large differences between uh, what some member states and the European Commission think the bioeconomy is, and we want this definition to be expanded uh, to include all the different things that the member states see in there. Um, we highlight the importance that we see of the bioeconomy strategy in relation to other policy areas uh, and things that are ongoing. And tomorrow in the evening, we will be, we'll be discussing how to deal with this. Uh, we get some uh, recommendations on governance, and lastly, we conclude uh, our arguments uh, with some uh, major recommendations. The next slides I will be uh, skipping because of the time, but you can have a look at those or ask me later during uh, the break. The technical note uh, now was based on the meeting held briefly that we had uh, after the first World Circular Economy Forum that was organized um, uh, by the Finns. And again, um, we collected views from member states uh, before the meeting. We attended the Circular Economy Forum and got some more input. And then we started at the meeting already drafting a technical note with the main lines of argumentation and some key messages. And again, a, a, a small team of volunteers then prepared the document that was sent around to the group for commenting on the time. So the main point that we make in this document is that we should see an overlap between the two concepts. And uh, we think that it's important to coordinate them uh, together uh, and to implement them together. Um, the circular economy has a lot of uh, positive aspects about it as well as the bioeconomy. And we think that if we really want to make Europe more sustainable and, and create jobs and uh, have a uh, more sustainable agriculture, more bio-based production, we need to really look at those two uh, concepts together and see uh, which can bring what for Europe. So they are very much complementary. Uh, they, have the, they face the same kind of hurdles. They have the same kind of research and innovation as regulatory needs, and therefore there needs to be um, a reinforcement uh, between those two, and also we need a better understanding uh, or a better definition of what the one is and what the other is. There was some confusing ideas going around, and, and uh, I also discovered this nationally when I talked with other people in the ministry that are responsible for the circular economy, that um, they had a completely different understanding of what the value economy is, and we had a different completely understanding of what the circular economy is. So we need to talk about uh, this more, and also we need to link the people that are responsible for these two um, policy areas more. So we need to have more interaction on the policy level, but also on the policy maker level, and then of course on the NGO, the industry, uh, and all the other levels, levels that are important. So we need some kind of strategic platform that can, where we can um, discuss those issues, uh, because as you see here, there are overlaps. Uh, between what we now see as a bioeconomy and uh, as a circular economy, and we think those overlaps are important to develop uh, for, for mutual benefit. And that is my very short presentation. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, write me an email or just ask me a little bit. Thank you very much for the presentation. So, if we have one question. Uh, I have a I didn't saw the common uh, the policy there. So we were talking about the circular economy, the private economy, but now not just about the agricultural policy. Yes, uh, the agricultural policy is one of the policy areas that we highlight in the policy brief on the future uh, bioeconomy strategy. Um, and that's one of the issues that we want to discuss tomorrow in the evening in this uh, session, uh, group three, I think it's the number, where we want to discuss with the uh, colleagues present there how we as staff can make a contribution onto all these ongoing discussions. And the common agricultural policy is, of course, a very important one. Uh, and we hope that we can have some input there. But we are 
I'm certain as to now as to you know how to do it. Uh, we have a letter prepared to the to the commissioner to the Andrews, um, on that we really want to contribute to this process. I think this is letter still still not yet. Yeah, concept letter. All will be discussed uh, at our meeting. We will be discussing uh, and meeting with the group on Thursday and Friday this week here in Tallinn. And so after this, I think we are well set to really get engaged in uh, the next year in, in, in this area. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So now we'll have a short movie. There will be no popcorn, no coke, so, but um, I hope you can survive. So. It will be 10 minutes uh, afterwards that we will have the lunch break, and after the lunch, there will be the discussions in the groups. So you have the group numbers, um, probably you know all the group numbers, but those who don't, uh, the groups were discussed, well, not discussed, but group, uh, group consistencies were when you were registered, so you can check your groups. So have a nice moon. So it's about uh, forest, uh, smart forest. First of all, could you please uh, introduce yourself? Okay, my name is Ignacio Martinez Gerardo. I am head of the, the regional office of the, for the Mediterranean of the European Forest Institute here in Barcelona. And you have invited the CAF Forest meeting in this beautiful building today. Could you please explain to us why? The European Forest Institute is an intergovernmental organization made by European countries which is also a network of forest research organizations. And uh, we work to defragment the landscape of forest research in Europe and to improve also global connections and uh, to develop research which is useful for policy making, for better policies. Our theme is to put knowledge into action. So we want to to mobilize also the research community and to help the research community to be more relevant so the knowledge can be better uptaken for, uh, for better policies and for innovation. We need all to understand that uh, at the European level we don't have forest policy, so the, for the forest policy is fragmented and the forest research is also, is also still quite fragmented. So the more we come together, the more we share our different views, our different priorities and we are able to and to develop consensus and to promote this at European level and the better for, for European forests. So the strategic working group for activities uh, is the, the which we really want to the value of this group? Alors la valeur ajoutée de d'un groupe comme ça, c'est euh, d'abord euh, pouvoir faire des, des échanges d'expériences entre entre États membres, bien sûr, de pouvoir euh, avoir une vision d'ensemble des, des capacités de, de recherche et d'innovation euh, pour le secteur forestier, et puis de préparer l'avenir en mobilisant des outils qui existent ou en imaginant d'autres types de de collaboration euh, entre États pour la, la recherche avec une vision également globale au niveau mondial, puisque les problèmes forestiers maintenant sont, sont mondiaux, donc il faut pouvoir euh, discuter du, du rôle de l'Europe dans le cadre des changements climatiques, euh, des politiques mises en place après l'accord de Paris, et des, des objectifs de développement durable, puisque les, les forêts, les systèmes forestiers, euh, les industries du bois jouent un rôle très, très important par rapport à l'ensemble de ces, de ces objectifs. It's an important platform both for, of course, for identifying common challenges and priorities, but also to uh, increase the awareness also of the differences, of course, among the countries and regions that are participating in SCAR. I mean, especially concerning an area such as developing the bioeconomy. Of course, there are inherent differences in terms of the land use traditions, the natural conditions and the attitudes, uh, focus of the industry and so on. So I think the added value of SCAR in this field is particularly high because we need to talk to each other and understand each other and uh, to, yeah, to exchange experiences and discuss this. Und was könnte man tun auf ähm, nationaler und europäischer Ebene, 
um die Ergebnisse dieser, äh, dieser Gruppe äh, besser zu verbreiten, um sie besser bekannt zu machen? Wir, also ich kann hier nur von der österreichischen Seite sprechen. Was wir einführen, ist, dass nach jedem äh, Meeting der Gruppe es zu einem Debriefing in Wien kommt mit den anderen äh, Gruppen, die in SCA äh, vorhanden sind, sodass es hier zu einem zwei- bis dreimaligen Austausch der Informationen kommt. Ähm, wir haben weiterhin einen, äh, die, die in, wir haben eine nationale Expertengruppe, die zuständig ist für eine Reflexion der verschiedenen äh, Informationen. Die wird ebenfalls zwei bis drei Mal im Jahr einberufen und über die werden die Ergebnisse, die wir hier in der Gruppe erarbeiten, weitergegeben. Und äh, natürlich äh, werden wir auch versuchen, in der nationalen Supportgruppe der Forest Technology Plattform die Ergebnisse äh, weiter zu verteilen. Vielen Dank für dieses Gespräch. Danke. Vielen Dank. Das ist das. And CASA is a European Horizon 2020 project to support ASCA activities. Uh, the coordinator of the project is Germany. It's uh, the project management Jülich. And in this project, there are five work packages. Um, the first one is uh, re representativeness. The second one is called added value and improve quality for greater impact. The third one is called strengthening, uh, strengthening strategic advice. WP4, uh, it's my work package, is uh, about communication and dissemination. And the last work package is the coordination and the management of the project. Uh, those terms of references will be used uh, for SWOT analysis on also presented in Tallinn. We have uh, guidelines on standardization procedures of initiating new activities, and those new activities are from SCAR. And um, we have sent them to the SCAR as well to get some feedback because the guidelines are for them. So uh, this is just ongoing discussion, so the waiting for feedback is, is going on, and then the guidelines will be finalized. And uh, why is it interesting for you to be involved in the SCAR Forest Group? Well, it's very interesting, very stimulating, because we, we meet with uh, other colleagues and other member states, states to exchange about uh, ideas for future research, uh, future research agenda, and also for, uh, for improving the collaboration between countries and building up a new uh, and uh, ambitious uh, European research area for the forest sector, very much in line with the uh, European forest uh, st strategy. My name is Hervé Jactel. I am a scientist uh, at the F Forest Research Institute in, uh, in Rare, France. And I'm the coordinator of this uh, experimental uh, site, which is uh, devoted to test the effect of forest diversity and forest ecosystem functioning. So we are manipulating the diversity of tree species to see what are the effects of uh, uh, tree diversity on both forest productivity and resistance to any kind of uh, disturbances. So forest can uh, contribute greatly to the bioeconomy in Europe through uh, the sector, for a sector of course, and uh, through uh, the provision of uh, um, large amount of course of biomass, but also uh, by providing uh, ecosystem services to the society. Uh, and the biomass, uh, which is provided by the forest, can also be valorized through different uh, uh, supply chains towards the markets of construction with wood, towards the markets of, uh, econ of energy and the uh, markets of uh, new materials, biosourced uh, materials. What about the aeronets? 
Yes, so we have two ARANET projects which are funding the research we, we are doing here. Uh, from, uh, one is from the Biodiversa uh, call. Um, the project is called Soil for Europe and it is funding the research we are making on the uh, below ground uh, ecological processes. So we are digging the ground and looking at uh, uh, the effect of tree species diversity on the functioning of the roots mycorrhiza and uh, soy fauna and the other ARANET project uh, we have for, for this uh, experiment is uh, called REFORM it's based on the uh, Sun Forest Coal and it's all about resilience of forest mixtures to drought and other climate change uh, effects. Thank you very much for this explanation. So, time for the applause. I think one of the denominator of the, or the common denominator of the, of the presentation prior lunch was uh, food first. So now there will be food. <laughs> so we will have uh, one hour for the lunch. The long lunch is served, I, I hope, in the same place where we had the morning coffee. And uh, you are waited here after one hour in the same room in the working group. So. Bon appétit. Welcome back and a warm welcome from my side to the audience here in the room and also to the persons following us via the web stream. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the team behind this conference who made this possible and all the efforts they put into it. So Helena and Kuli from the Estonian uh, um, Ministry for Rural Affairs and uh, Christine Wundhoff and Dorite Borgdehorst uh, from the Netherlands, uh, Christine from Wageningen Research and Dori from a private company which uh, implemented the death study looking at representativeness and participation in the different working groups. On this you will hear tomorrow more. The uh, preliminary outcomes and uh, followed by interactive sessions and uh, to Vera Steinberg uh, from the Federal Agency for Agricultural and Food from Germany and May Fenchen, you listened already to one of her presentations this morning and Laura Devenay from Work Package 3. Um, they will introduce you in a, a short uh, time about the a SWOT assessment they made and followed by also interactive uh, working sessions uh, uh, concerning the SWOT uh, results and outcomes. Maeve will introduce you uh, after my brief uh, welcome uh, to this session and also I would like to thank my colleague Hannah Steffens uh, who is also a, a member of the project management office in Jülich and also to all the persons behind this conference uh, doing uh, all the bits and pieces to, to um, yeah, facilitate it. So uh, in the first uh, two sessions this morning, you heard a brief history, a reflection of the Standing Committee of Agricultural Research uh, by Mike. Thanks for this. And uh, in the following session, you heard about uh, policy developments in, for example, France and also in Ireland, and you got some policy briefs out of uh, collaborative uh, strategic working groups in the SCA. And um, I would like to pick up where Mike uh, left. So there is a development in SCA, and uh, to, to have a reflection on what has been done in the past, what could be options for the future in 2015. Um, the SCA published uh, a reflection paper where they yeah, showed what, what was done in the past, what error nets or joint programming initiatives has been um, developed through the standing committee and uh, the collaborative and strategic working groups. And um, in this uh, reflection paper, there was an outlook, uh, several options for options were uh, described, how the SCA could operate in the future and um, it was decided that uh, we should follow a more, um, more eager um, uh, participation and um, the work done in the committee uh, 
And this was uh, an option which uh, wanted to, to increase and broaden also the participation to have a stronger impact and a better alignment of the different research strategies and programs uh, in the bioeconomy sector and also, of course, the agriculture area. And um, so this was uh, published, I think, in June 2015. And uh, after publication of this um, uh, reflection paper, there were discussions with the commission if we could uh, yeah, have some support, coordination and support action to follow uh, this, uh, yeah, this decision. And uh, in the following weeks, uh, uh, coordination and support action topic was introduced into the work program and uh, already in mid end of August, two uh, mid end uh, 2015, um, uh, 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 workshops took place to, to discuss and decide on what the aims of the possible coordination and support action should be. And uh, in the following uh, workshops uh, tackling this issue, uh, a core consortium was formed uh, uh, with 10 partners and uh, in the um, weeks yeah, following this and the preparation of the um, proposal, uh, five work packages were defined. Uh, so the first one is representativeness, looking on yeah, the participation of the different countries, what ministries uh, are coming to what meetings. And the second uh, work package, this was also briefly uh, brought up in the film we saw from the forest group. The second one is added value and improved quality for um, greater impact. And um, the third one, strengthening strategic advice. And the fourth one, communication and dissemination activities. So um, I have uh, some of the flyers prepared by work package four. So they are quite appealing, and if you are not yet active in one of these groups, uh, I urge you to take some of the flyers with you back and uh, show them to your colleagues in the ministries or um, um, federal offices you might have in these areas to, to see what is done in the groups, what is planned in the future, and if it might be interesting for you to also participate in it. Furthermore, um, also in Work Package 4, a newsletter has been published now uh, before the plenary meeting. Um, copies of the flyers and the newsletter uh, are on the table at the entrance area. And there is also a flyer about CASA, the Coordination Support Action, and uh, where yeah, a brief reflection is given what, what the CSA is about and what we aim for. So. Um, if you have questions concerning CASA, you could also come to, to me and ask me questions or also to the colleagues for the different work packages if it's more uh, questions concerning representativeness or SWOT. And um, yes, and uh, that's more or less from my side. Uh, what, what is planned will be introduced now uh, by Maeve. And yeah, I wish you all a fruitful discussion and interactive sessions and uh, good outcomes of the workshops. Thanks. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction to the sessions. As Ralph said, um, we were do, charged with doing a SWOT analysis SWOT analysis within the CASA project, and we were actually charged with doing a SWOT analysis initially of the bioeconomy, but obviously the um, Bioeconomy Observatory is now doing that work. So we changed that um, as a consortium to looking at a SWOT of the structure of the SCAR, and that's what the workshop this afternoon is going to be about. But we also did a SWOT of the research and innovation policy landscape around the um, around the bioeconomy. So I'm just going to give you a flavour for um, what we did in that space. Um, so. Um, the, just to flick through, we did uh, the assessment and SWOT analysis of the state of play of the research and innovation policy landscape. A report has been completed on that and it should be available currently on the um, CASA website. And we then did, a, we didn't do that, as I said, the SWOT analysis of the European bioeconomy because that's been taken care of elsewhere. So we did a revised, um, 
We had a revised task looking at a SWOT of the SCAR itself. The methodology, which Laura will elaborate on because she was the person who actually did all the work, was involving desk research and executive one-to-one -one interviews, and many of you who were here would have been involved in that already. So the purpose of this workshop then is sense checking the results from the, those interviews and trying to, I suppose, put some prioritization around the SWOTs and trying to come forward with some, some, some next steps around it. Um, so the, the focus of the breakout activity one is the sense checking around that. And the, fo the focus of activity two is going to be the, 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 the next steps and the moving forward. So Laura will elaborate on those for you um, shortly. So I'm just going to give you a flavour of um, what was in the Research and Innovation Policy Landscape SWOT document. I suppose the, the structure, the kind of overarching structure we had in mind at the time was in uh, cognizant of the European paradox, whereby we do a lot of research but don't always commercialise it or bring it to, um, to, through to um, commercialisation. So we try to look at different initiatives that are in play, bearing in mind kind of the, the basic kind of TRLs from one to nine, trying to see was there research, were there research and innovation policy initiatives focused across across the spectrum. And having done that, then we looked at uh, we looked at the innovation system literature, and it talks about various structural failures whereby policy would have a role. And within that, then we identified that the um, policy landscape is addressing infrastructural deficits to a certain extent. For example, there is support for demonstration facilities and pilot flat plants. It's also identifying capabilities failures. Sorry to too fast. But my English is not too good. Not okay. 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 Sorry. So. Okay. okay. So we, we did a review of the re the research and innovation policy landscape. Our research and innovation policy landscape took the TRLs from one to nine as the framework to look at initiatives that are in place. And within once we had that done, then we looked at uh, the innovation systems literature to try to see, you know, can we see is it working as a system? Are there failures within the system? And the innovation literature would suggest that there were four possible failures, infrastructural failures, capabilities failures, network failures, and institutional failures. And when we looked at the research and innovation policy landscape, it was clear that there were certain elements that were addressing these, at least to some extent. The next thing we looked at was the bioeconomy as a transition. So not in terms of the innovation system, but seeing as there are research and innovation policies that support the bioeconomy as a transition. So they talk about in the literature about um, system failures in terms of policy coordination failures, directionality failures, demand articulation failures, and reflexivity failures. And I think we have highlighted there are a number of areas when we look at the bioeconomy as a, transfer, as a trans transformation that there are failures within the research and innovation policy landscape. So that's just to give you a flavour for what's in that document. The full report is available on the CASA website. So I just wanted to take this opportunity just to give you a flavour for what is there. Um, so the highlights is that there, and just I suppose to give the positive, um, we've, we've uh, identified there has been significant progress since the 2012 uh, bioeconomy strategy was established. That there are a plethora, as we have, I suppose, acknowledged this morning, a plethora of policies, programs and practices that can impact on the bioeconomy. And really at this stage what we need to do is reflect on where we are, we need to monitor what we're doing and we need to monitor the implementation and the impact and obviously around that develop metrics to support the measurement of impact as well. And policy coordination obviously is critical and that's a message I think that has been coming out this morning as well. There are so many <coughs> policies and programs that impact and we just need to, to look at those. Um, so that's just it in terms of an overview of the work that we have been doing, the SWOT of the SCAR structure, which is going to be the focus of our activities now, and the SWOT of the research and innovation policy landscape. Thank you. Okay, thanks Maeve. Um, hi everybody. Uh, you will have seen the posted fairies and flip chart fairies we're in uh, over the lunch break. Could I get everybody now to move into the groups that they were assigned to? So there's a table plan on the door there. So we've group one up the back, group two uh, in the middle here on the left, group three down the front, four in this middle section, five down here, and six, seven, eight. So if I could get everybody to move now before we start the workshop, that would be great. Yeah, I 
think we just have a tendency to speak as quickly as possible. Getting there? <laughs> Group seven, maybe? I don't know. There's out the names for Group 7 because there seems to be some confusion. Serenella Puglia, Puliga should be in Group 7. Stefan Rauschen should be in Group 7. And group 7 is over here. Inge Van Oost should be in Group 7. Martin Gremmel should be in Group 7. Um, Iva Jelenikova should be in Group 7. Surly Pema should be in Group 7. Monica Respeka should be in Group 7. Okay, Lucia Ekaterina Yadu should be in Group 7. So do, do you all, are you all in your right groups? We might just have to remix then when we see, obviously some people are missing. So Group 2 is quite big over there. I'm just going to target yeah, Group 2 there. Okay, I think we're getting there, are we? Roughly. There's meant to be about eight people per group, so... You have three. Okay, group seven. Group six, you look great up there. Group eight, you look good. Group four, five. Group two is probably... Or maybe, maybe could one or two from group four perhaps move to group seven if uh, maybe there's some people missing. Would be great. And we can add maybe six per group. Does that work? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so people you can have a chat with. That's, uh, that's the aim of today. Okay, we might get started then. That's looking roughly even, but we can, we can mix and match after. Um, so, as Maeve has mentioned there, we were responsible for conducting this SWOT analysis of the SCAR. So, by SWOT, we mean the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, the threats of its current structure and its current configuration before we make any recommendations of how it might change into the future. So, I'm presenting some of the preliminary results from phase one of this research, which involved the key informant interviews. That was with a selection number of individuals. So I really want to sense check those results with you today. We have a much bigger group here, so please rip them apart. Tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me where I'm right, hopefully as well. Confirm and deny um, as you see fit. So Mike Collins, thankfully, uh, gave a bit of the history of SCAR, so I can just scan over this. But I think just important to reflect of what, on why the SCAR was established in the first place back in 1974. So it was really with this aim of coordinating agricultural research focusing on organizing the efforts of the member states, ensuring the effective use of research results, and really this was orientated largely around the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy. So in this sense, SCAR was aiming to work towards this uh, European research area and the coordination of national research programs, as we discussed earlier, by facilitating knowledge exchange and knowledge transfer between the member states. So this effort to align, um, I suppose, our agendas. 
The relaunch in 2005 uh, saw it move uh, to DG Research. So this was really bringing in a strategic <coughs> policy advice aspect to SCAR, which had been missing before. So it was requested to advise the EC and the member states on the coordination of agriculture and bioeconomy research. So this is where we start seeing the coupling of research and innovation, discussion of partnerships, more effective public-to-public -public and public-private partnerships, and how we might get the different sectoral actors to work together to address the challenges facing European agriculture and the European bioeconomy. So that was the renewed mandate, if we look at that, um, published in 2008, really saw the broadening of agriculture research. So SCAR really constantly changes and evolves as agriculture itself has evolved as well. So this is where we start seeing this farm to fo fork approach that we need to consider production and consumption side considerations focusing themes on the sustainability of agriculture and the broader sustainable development of agriculture in Europe, considering non-food uses. So really, quite ahead of its time, considering the bioeconomy strategy in Europe was published in 2012. From 2005 onwards, SCAR was talking about including forestry, including fisheries, aligning all of our biomass resources, and considering non-food uses for them, so perhaps biochemical production, bioenergy. And it was around this KBBE, the knowledge-based bioeconomy. So that then was the, the renewed mandate, I suppose, for SCAR, was still focusing on uh, the production and sharing of agricultural knowledge, consolidating joint research program, programming, and incorporating this multi-actor integration. So that's, I suppose, how SCAR uh, looks today. This is how it achieves these aims and objectives. So we see the overarching aim for the European research area, this new piece on strategic policy advice, both to the EC and to the member states. And it achieves this through three key pillars. So developing the strong foresight process. Um, I know many in the room have been involved in that as well. So this is horizon scanning, realizing it's a, a complex and challenging area uh, that we are facing in the bioeconomy. So trying to horizon scan what's coming down the track and how we can use this to um, prioritize our research agendas. Developing common research agendas then, really a core remit and, and founding purpose of SCAR. And we've seen over 20 strategic and collaborative working groups established with this aim. So to bring actors together from the different member states on a voluntary capacity to discuss common definitions, common challenges, uh, what they're seeing in their member state research agendas or what they envisage for the future. And the third pillar then is around mapping um, SCAR research capacities and maybe European research capacities more broadly as well. So this one's quite interesting if, uh, as a newcomer to SCAR, looking at the website, it discusses more of these mapping activities happening around 2005, 2006, and a bit through the ERANETs and the strategic working groups now. So that mapping and review element of SCAR certainly is within its, its founding uh, structure. And that's the SCAR then we have today. So we see 37 member states, or different countries taking part, uh, members being the ministries of the different member states, and then with candidate and associate countries as observers. So then with, the, with this in mind, with this background context in mind, we were aiming to analyze, okay, how is the SCAR functioning now in its current configuration? What are its processes like? How well is it coordinated? What structures facilitate this? And that looking for these strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, the threats. You'll be sick of hearing that by the end of this afternoon. So it's to assess really the current state of play and to provide that evidence base, as I say, before we make any recommendations, how we might change the functions to, for improved impact and activities in the future. In my head, it really was about learning from the past, not, not making uh, the mistakes of, of history and really looking and studying the past if you want to define the future. So it was with this purpose, as I said, the state of play plus, so looking to next steps and what changes uh, can come ahead. So really, I think for us, Work Package 3 uh, has formed sort of a consolidating uh, role within CASA as well, trying to connect up the other work packages, working on representativeness uh, on communication aspects as well. So to achieve this then, as I mentioned, phase one of the SWOT of the SCAR was based around a key informant interview phase. So it was based on the semi-structured interview format, which is a renowned social science methodology, simply defined there as a conversation with a purpose. So we look there that we can really probe people's underlying meanings and their experiences, the rationale behind the way they're thinking, with a semi-structured format allowing for some flexibility uh, in the interview conversation. So I had a certain question schedule, certain topics to cover based loosely around that SWOT-type framework, 
but the semi-structured nature meant we could go off on tangents and have some flexibility for topics that I mightn't have even considered would be important to SCAR. So that, that was the semi-structured nature of them. Uh, I conducted 13 interviews in total with select individuals, and really the people were chosen um, as a result of diversity of affiliation and country profile as well. So looking at people who are involved in different structures of SCAR, so from the working group level, the foresight level, the steering group level, but also some external um, perspectives as well. So people from European Commission, DG Agri, DG Research also participated, and from the JPIs, the Aeronets, the, the sort of bottom tier for SCAR as well. I must emphasize the results today. This is what's presented here on the flip charts. It's not representative, so it is from the select number of individuals, which is why you lovely 67-ish people will be confirming or denying the results then today. So it's to get broader consensus on these. Um, I conducted the interviews in person where I could, uh, or if not, over the phone. I was certainly happy one side. I don't know if my interviewees would agree. It was such a, a positive phone call. But for me, it was very informative, I think, to engage with these different individuals from different countries and different professional experience with SCAR. So just to give you uh, an idea, I suppose, of the diversity of participants for this first research phase. So each star that's popping up here represents one interviewee. So you can see a, a real mix, I suppose, across uh, the member states. So trying really to target the more established member states, but also these newer member states that we're hearing so much about in terms of participation, representativeness in SCAR. Mm -hmm. uh, across affiliation profiles, again, you can see their primary affiliations um, with diversity across the organization. You can see that a bit more clearly uh, in this chart here. So three of my interviewees were actually on an overarching tier working above the SCAR uh, at the European Commission level. Five of the interviewees were from the decision-making tier, and um, particularly from the SCAR steering group, as it's now called, um, with a diversity of country profiles here. Four from this implementation phase were our strategic collaborative working groups, and the foresight group as well. One person in particular was from a, a particular uh, outcome of one of these era building measures, but I have plus five in there because a lot of our interviewees, they were involved in multiple aspects, and in fact, we chose people who were involved in the steering group, but also had a role maybe in an era net, or were involved in a strategic working group, but contribute to JPIs. So we had uh, quite a, a good representation, I think, of the different stakeholders involved with SCAR. So that's what we set out, really, as the objective of the interviews, was to improve the overall organization, communication, and dissemination of SCAR activities, outputs, and outcomes. And doing this through the SWOT analysis technique, um, and looking, I suppose, at its influence currently and its coordination currently. We examined issues of legitimacy, of influence, of relevance and political impact of SCAR, particularly in terms of its internal structures. We also had a, a form of foresight as well, that horizon scanning feature, looking for threats and opportunities coming down the track, and to consider really what is the evolving uh, role of SCAR, I suppose, and how will the structure change and evolve to meet new demands that come its way. So we've seen already today how it's evolved since 1974, so we're looking how is it going to change more in the future. So kind of the, the beauty of this technique is you get both an internal perspective, I suppose, of SCAR in terms of its internal strengths and weaknesses, and then that external perspective then in terms of future opportunities and threats. So that's just to give it a bit of context, I suppose, to the results that are Littered, literally littered around you uh, right here. Uh, I have copies of all the slides there for each group, if anybody wants to pick them up now, uh, just to work through some of the preliminary results. So I will go through these quite quickly, but the point of the afternoon is to discuss them in more detail. So you'll be deliberating them as your group, you'll be working in pairs, you'll be working as a group, we'll have nice post-its and pens and all the usual workshop uh, facilities. But this is just to give a taster, I suppose, of the preliminary results that came out of that interview phase. So that's in terms of the overview. You'll see you have uh, four posters in each group. Of the first one, uh, we the first one posted up there in terms of the strengths. So for the purposes of the workshop today, we've identified seven key strengths, seven key weaknesses, seven opportunities, and seven threats. So these are the themes that were common across the 13 interviews and that I want you to confirm or deny today and indeed elaborate further. So to give an overview then of the strengths of the SCAR. So you can be thinking while I'm going through these, do you agree with this? Do you disagree? Does it vary per country? Is it something you've experienced in your country? So we'll move through the different themes as such. 
So the first strand really for SCAR was a real positivity, I suppose, of its connecting force between member states. So an area and a space for knowledge exchange, for networking and collaboration between the member states. So for many of the interviewees, this was something quite rare, I suppose, at a European level, to bring people together to learn these valuable lessons from one another, engage in knowledge transfer, particularly at that policy and program level. So it was thought that researchers are already well networked and attend many conferences and networking events together. So connecting the, funder, the funders, the, the funding bodies. And the vast information and knowledge of SCAR, obviously a huge strength in terms of the expertise available, uh, particularly in agricultural arenas. Secondly, we were looking at a strength in terms of research coordination. And for many, this was really achieved through the output activities of SCAR. So that bottom tier that I pointed to in terms of the ERNS, the JPIs, for many, this is where the true impact of SCAR lies, um, and all, all the time building towards that common European research area. The dedication of participants, uh, for those of you involved in SCAR, you'll be pleased to know you were highly praised in terms of your commitment and enthusiasm that you bring uh, to the table. Um, so certainly the people power of SCAR, the strong connections uh, and networks that they bring to the organization from their respective member states was seen as a huge strength and positive, along with uh, the independence of the organization. So even we were chatting a bit at lunch there in terms of having space, I suppose, to be free of political agendas, um, and SCAR was seen to facilitate that, that it's not quite as embedded in the European Commission that gives it a certain bit of freedom. Uh, fifth strength then of the seven uh, relates to the evolving and flexible SCAR structure. So many seeing that the, the structure, the hierarchy chart that I showed there previously, it's evolved as such, but that it serves its function quite well. So it's seen as quite efficient by many, particularly in terms of that inner framework with the belief that uh, you can participate uh, in certain areas of the SCAR, you can add more working groups as needed or remove them as necessary as well. And the steering group really praised as that effective engine of the organization. The parent structure under G DG Research, also seen as a, as a key strength for SCAR right now, uh, that with continued support and coordination from DG Agri was seen as important. So it was appropriate, I suppose, to nest it under DG Research. We've heard that it did fall dormant, I think, for almost two decades under DG Agriculture. So it really gave it a renewed sense of purpose and mission under DG Research. And finally, the seventh strength relates to the broad scope of SCAR, so that ability to evolve as agriculture evolves and increasingly widen its remit. So there are seven of the strengths that came out. You might agree, you might disagree, and that's what we'll discuss further today. Some of these might also double up that they're simultaneously a strength, but can also be a weakness as well. So we can tease those issues apart um, in the workshop phase. Turning to the weaknesses, so not being the, the negative ninny, but we need to, to highlight some areas and gaps, I suppose, if we're trying to look for improvement and improved impact. So again, to be explored in more detail in each group, these seven uh, weaknesses. So these include a lessening impact of SCAR on research and innovation policy and programs. So this was seen at both EU levels and national levels. So people were really um, quite frustrated in a way that there's a, a form of implementation deficit, that there's a lot of great knowledge and results from SCAR, but how are they actioned in practice? So there was seen as a lessening impact in SCAR that certainly it had a, a major role in Horizon 2020, but beyond that, or even moving into FP9, uh, what is the impact of SCAR? At a national level as well, what is the impact in terms of influencing national research and innovation policy agendas? And this was seen to be uh, quite missing at present across many of the member states. Inconsistencies in high-level political commitment to SCAR. So this was seen as, as a weakness of the organization. Interestingly, not just talking about policymaker engagement, but actually politician engagement with SCAR. So this was to ensure buy-in, I suppose, particularly at a national level from your governmental hierarchies, that they see the value in participating in SCAR and in, in investing in this knowledge exchange platform. Increasingly complicated, of course, with lessening resources across the civil service. I mean, that's a Europe-wide issue, and it's resulting in less resources being assigned to discussing um, research agendas as such. Difficulties in coordination came up as another weakness, so this was both vertically and horizontally within the structure, in terms of a number of inefficiencies and overlap. So there was inefficiencies in particular seen at the steering group level, 
So this was in terms of, I think, lately some of the working groups are now presenting to the steering group that there's limited time for feedback and discussion that they can often quite rush through an agenda. So perhaps there's some um, improvements that we could make here. Um, in terms of overlap, we've, we've already discussed it. What is the duplication overlap and, and potential for synergies? Of course, there's opportunities in some of these weaknesses between the different working groups. Um, and the era building measures. So a sense that in many of the strategic and collaborative working groups, that it's often the same people in the era nets, the JPIs duplicating uh, work programs. There was a sense of weak cooperation as well amongst that uh, bottom tier, um, which we've already discussed today. Fourthly, in terms of weaknesses, lack of SCAR visibility and awareness. Um, I know this is something CASA is conscious of as well through its communications work package is the lack of visibility for SCAR and awareness of SCAR outside of those involved in it. So everybody in this room, you know, I'm probably preaching to the converted, they know about SCAR, but outside of that, uh, what is the impact and outreach? Not helped in a way by its limited online presence uh, in terms of its website and social media as well, and some people linking this with persisting traditional communications from the organization, perhaps the lack of skills or the age profile of SCAR maybe not uh, helping in this sense. Feel free to agree or disagree, as I say. These are the weaknesses. These are the tricky ones. So in terms of the fifth, am I on the fifth one? Yeah, of seven. Uh, in terms of weaknesses, the limited opportunities for new blood in SCAR and a lack of transparency really around the recruitment process. So even for those heavily engaged with the organization, there was still confusion, a lack of clarity, a distinct muddiness, I suppose, in terms of plenary and steering group delegations and the selection process for the working group experts and really moving this beyond who you know. So moving beyond a reliance on personal contacts uh, and connections. There was desire for the inclusion of newer generations and uh, to perhaps help with that um, aspect of improved outreach and continue breaking down some of the language barriers in SCAR as well. So there was a sense that perhaps newer officials and delegates, English uh, is perhaps a more uh, common language there, that that might help. Limited ministerial involvement outside of agriculture and science was seen as a, a weakness, I suppose, in terms of SCAR's bioeconomy potential. So we know the bioeconomy involves so many more ministries outside of DG agriculture or, or ministries of agriculture or ministries of science. So there was that sense that it's quite a legacy, I suppose, of the parental structure under DG Agri, that it is mainly <coughs> agricultural representatives that attend the steering group and as I say, problematic in terms of the holistic bioeconomy thinking. So there was a sense that there's still quite conservative discussions, um, even at steering group level, in terms of forestry potential uh, or marine potential and, and aligning this with agriculture. And perhaps further gaps in terms of the fact that most national research and, research and innovation policies are created by ministries of science, not by ministries of agriculture. So that for some people created gaps then when trying to report back to their member state level. And as a seventh one, we're putting in that idea of representativeness. Obviously, that is a, a key weakness of SCAR that we're aiming to address. Um, Dory circulated a brilliant report on that, which hopefully people got to read, and that will be discussed in more detail tomorrow. So just want to acknowledge it here. It'll be discussed in depth tomorrow, as I say, but it uh, needs to be included, I think, in terms of the, the top seven weaknesses. Opportunities, we'll go back positive for a little while. <laughs> So this is the, the seven opportunities for SCAR. So thinking of an evolving SCAR structure, where it's moving in the future. Um, opportunity to change the scope of SCAR. So what was really interesting in my discussions here with people is they kind of, they went one of two ways with this. So to change the scope, number one, was either to refocus on SCAR's original purpose. So bring it back to that original remit to establish the European research area and coordinate and align agricultural research that we should do it right and do it well and bring it back to its primary focus. Others, however, push to extend the remit so that it really should truly and holistically encompass this idea of the bioeconomy. That we can uh, bridge, I suppose, the land and sea divide, that align all biomass resources, consider production and consumption considerations for a truly holistic and supported European bioeconomy development. So I'm really interested when we move to the opportunity section, people's uh, opinions here about refocusing or extending and when we're thinking of this, the future scope of SCAR. A second opportunity relates to potential for global influence. So to, for SCAR, not only to be influenced by global agendas, but be a key influencer at the global level as well. So having a role, for example, in defining some of the sustainable development goals 
And there was a real belief in positivity, positivity that SCAR has a strong foundation to achieve this um, with potential roles in the International Bioeconomy Forum, I think a real positive and highlight um, opportunity for many. There's an opportunity to set clear SCAR mandates regarding national research and innovation policy influence. Is this something we want SCAR to achieve? Is this something that's critical? And if so, we need to set measurable targets and deliverables to improve the knowledge transfer as people attend SCAR meetings that they bring this knowledge back to their member states. More direct contact with different DGs was also put forward as an option and two-way interactions in this sense. So it was recognizing that if we're moving to the bioeconomy agenda, there's wider opportunities to work with other policies beyond uh, Horizon 2020 and not just ORI policy. So in terms of fisheries, environment, climate change, climate action, circular economy. And a belief amongst some of the interviewees that this should be a two-way process. So more engagement, not just from DG Agriculture and DG Research, but from DG Mara, DG Environment, DG Grow, and other DGs that will have relevance in the bioeconomy space, that they attend SCAR meetings and SCAR delegates also go out and present to them as well. Fifth opportunity involves an increased role for the regional scale in SCAR. So here I'm talking about the subnational scale. Um, certainly in Ireland, we, we tend to operate as, as one whole because we're quite small, but talking to other member states, I know the regional scale can be really key in terms of research and innovation policy and, and practice. So is there a potential for regional representatives in the SCAR SG? Should it not just be national delegates? So these are all up for debate and consideration today. Along with that increased multi-actor framing in the future so that we're, there are increasingly new numbers of actors participating in the research arena. So we've multinational corporations, NGOs, uh, cities, regions, researchers. Should these all be engaged uh, a bit more in SCAR? And how might we engage them in a transparent way? So they will all have agendas to the table. Is there a way we can, we can bring them there, if this is desirable, in a transparent fashion? So that's opportunities for new fora for engagement and truly opening up European science. And also perhaps increasing connections with other bioeconomy organizations like the BBI or the Bioeconomy Observatory. And the final opportunity there then is in terms of opportunities for SCAR in the evolving research agenda. So we're seeing Food 2030 really placing food back at the heart of the bioeconomy. These new FP9 uh, mission orientations, what will they mean for SCAR and potential for more socially value added research. Okay, and we're getting there. So finally, the threats. So the seven threats to discuss today. Um, again, these are from mostly an external perspective. So what's coming down the track? Something that might be out of the control of SCAR but that will influence its functioning and its operations. The first, um, a lot of people straight away jumped to was these geopolitical tensions. So obviously the impact of Brexit was of concern in terms of what would that mean for the UK involvement and the potential for other countries to follow. If we're thinking 10, 20, 30 years down the track, what will the EU even look like? And what would that mean for SCAR? A growing complexity of bioeconomy research and innovation actors um, raises threats, I suppose, for SCAR in terms of maintaining relevance. So the danger of SCAR to become redundant uh, and irrelevant in this changing landscape and competing with these other agendas. So it was recognizing that SCAR was established in a different time and it needs to involve perhaps uh, more required. We see some vulnerabilities in terms of human capital as well. I suppose like any organization, SCAR is um, under threat and vulnerability to staff mobility, staff turnover, cutbacks, retirements, and dedication. So this includes, I think, both in terms at a national level where budget constraints might res restrict um, member states from um, participating in the steering group, that core membership of SCAR. There was a real sense of the reliance on particularly enthusiastic uh, or dedicated chairs within the strategic and collaborative working groups, and this could really make or break um, some of their successes. So there was an interesting uh, point earlier, the spider in the middle of the web. So that, who is that spider and can, can they be crushed or how enthusiastic is that spider? And that, that's quite a vulnerability, I suppose, for uh, any um, organization. And it's important, I suppose, highlighting of identifying the right people internally and externally for greater impact. Fourthly, uh, there was concern for the sustainability of supports induced by CASA. So this was quite a, a nice thing, obviously, to hear. Being involved in CASA, there was quite a positivity around the increased coordination that has brought to SCAR and the, the diverse working groups. But what happens when the project finishes? So it's a three-year funding. What happens after that? And, and can we have some sustainability here? 
And the final three threats then uh, relate at a broader level, the challenges of multidisciplinarity that we all battle with, I think. So it's that challenge of trying to retain a certain depth and quality of expertise while still having that breadth and that, that broad brush, I suppose, approach that we can see the bigger picture and connect the dots between sectors, increasingly important, I suppose, in the bioeconomy. This linked in with the challenge of information overload as well for people participating in SCAR. And I'm sure everyone in this room, it's really hard to keep on track of every single development with so much information day in, day out. So this is a, a challenge certainly for the members to keep updated. Touched on a little bit uh, just before lunch there was the differing definitions of the bioeconomy and how might this impact on SCAR? That it could pull it in different directions if we go a particularly biotechnology route or a bioresource route. What will that mean for SCAR and its key aims and objectives? So it'll be interesting to keep, keep an eye on those uh, policy revisions. And finally, a threat in terms of the diversity uh, amongst research systems and the associated supports across the EU. So we're well aware there is differences uh, in finances, in support schemes there, and it highlights a need, I suppose, to, to invest further to support uh, SCAR participation. So that was a whistle-stop tour. That has been my life for the last few months. So trying to condense this into, into a few slides and into a few posters um, is what has happened here. So to elaborate these, these results further, as I said, these were select interviewees. These are select themes that we have come up with. Uh, we would like to elaborate them a bit further with you all. So the aim, as Maeve mentioned, is to sense check the results, so clarify any factual inaccuracies, particularly discuss any areas of disagreement. Nobody has shouted at me yet, so that's quite a, quite a positive, I suppose. Identify any missing elements. This is not uh, a complete list either, so there's post-its on that for you to add further to the posters that are there. And eradicate any miscommunications as well. Uh, the second aim after coffee will be to prioritize the SWOT. So what are the principal strengths, the principal weaknesses, the emergent priority opportunities, and the fundamental threats? So we can discuss that more after the break along with the next steps. So that's, I suppose, the time schedule for now. What are we at just after quarter past? So activity one is the sense check. Build towards three o'clock. I'll give you coffee then. And then you'll be, you'll be refreshed for, for phase two, which will be the ranking prioritization uh, and a bit of group feedback then. Uh, and then there is a lovely tour of Tallinn, and I will stop talking, so you can uh, all enjoy that then this evening. So just a little bit of work before, before we get to the Christmas markets. Uh, so in terms of logistics then, um, so you're all sitting in your tables. Is everyone happy kind of with the numbers they have? Nobody's, did seven improve a little bit there? We have five people there. Yeah, or even maybe another one could turn around there. So if there's kind of six, six or eight per group would be great. Um, and from each table then, I'll need a volunteer table host. So it's such, such a big group to be dealing with, just to help me a little bit with the facilitation, to keep discussion on point in your groups, um, ensuring everybody has their say, to help a little bit with the timekeeping and to uh, help me out with that bit of table feedback. So any volunteers? Can I move, where are we, group one up the back? that are not listening to me, which is not helpful. Group one, any volunteers for a table host up there? Can someone help out just taking notes, keeping track of discussion? Christine, yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, table two? Table two, any table host there I can turn to? No? Oh, they're still shuffling groups. Table two, can I, can I nominate a table host? Please? Okay, they're still chatting. Table three? Can you, Sylvia? Thank you. Uh, table five down the front here. Any volunteers? I love how everyone's avoiding my eye contact when I move to their group. It's just like... <laughs> table four? Can we have a volunteer up there? Nothing too onerous, I promise. We won't, uh, we won't be putting you on the spot too much. Hannah, thank you, thank you. Uh, table six up the back. Anyone can help with that? Rolf, thank you. Seven. <laughs> if there was, thank you, great, perfect. And table eight, down the front here, Dory. Okay, sorry. 
And table two, do we have a table host for table two there? Decided, yeah? Self-nominated or, you know, forced? Group, group consensus, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Vera for five, is it? Yeah. Perfect, okay. Great stuff. So uh, I can run through the, the workshop activities now. Just to note that if you have anything else you'd like to add to the discussion in a more individual or confidential manner, um, do email myself uh, or Maeve uh, in Chagas. We're um, open to that. Our emails are on the sheets there. So breakout activity one. So your purpose now is for the sense checking of those results. So the seven elements of each quadrant that I highlighted this kind of quality control check to ensure trustworthiness of the data. Um, and this is how we'll do it. So I'll, I'll leave these instructions up. Um, so you'll see at each uh, table grouping, we have one A3 poster. So you'll see them posted up there in terms of strengths. We're going to spend 10 minutes on each quadrant. So 10 minutes on strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. First of all, if you could turn to your neighbor, say hello, because you're going to work in pairs initially. Uh, so Maeve has there uh, an A4 um, printout of these posters, just to make it a bit easier to work in pairs. So to discuss as a pair first your areas of disagreement uh, and agreement, hopefully, on each of these. So as a pair, you need to decide if you're assigning an agree, so you're ticking, you disagree is an X, or you're unsure is a question mark if you can't reach consensus in your pair. And then put this up on the bigger poster. So table hosts, for every poster, we need four ticks for each element, roughly, according to the pairs in your group. Um, you can use, there's post-its there if you want to elaborate any areas of disagreement. So if you do put an X, please tell me why, so I can, I can qualify it and, and build it into my results further. Um, and certainly, if there's anything else you would want to add, so if you have 8, 9, 10, 11, again, further post-its, or, or even write them directly on the sheet there if there is room, um, we welcome further additions. So is that clear enough for activity one? So work in your pairs first with your A4s, put your tick, your X, or your question mark on the A3, uh, and battle it out then for areas of disagreement. OK? So we have 10 minutes for uh, strengths. I have little timers up here. So I'll hit this going, and you'll see the time uh, counting down. So 